OK, so uh, yeah, so this is the, the last lecture. So today, we are going to be talking about uh, how to build a safe advanced AI. Um, so we're not quite going to be doing that, uh, because I don't know how to do that. But we are going to be talking about some ways that people have proposed to attempt to do that. So you know, up to this point, we have tried to cover a bunch of the sort of you know, preliminaries and I think you know, really important things to understand, how to think about um, AI safety uh, proposals and concepts. Uh, and so today, we're sort of going to be looking through a bunch of additional proposals that we haven't yet looked at and really sort of trying to go in depth and understand you know, what is the rationale for all of these various different things that people are thinking about. Uh, you know, why might you want to do some of these various different, uh, you know, uh, proposals? Okay, so, you know, this is, you know, just to recap, we've already sort of gone over this, but, you know, we want to sort of want to talk about, and, you know, establish at the very beginning, you know, how do we evaluate a proposal for, you know, building some sort of powerful, safe, you know, advanced AI system? So the sort of criteria that we're going to be looking at, and these are the same ones that we talked about earlier, we have this sort of general version of outer alignment which is you know, whatever the thing that we're trying to get, whatever algorithm we want our model to be implementing, you know, this sort of training goal, uh, why would that be good? Why would it be good you know, for us to in fact get a model that is the sort of model that we want? We have this sort of generalized version of inner alignment, which is uh, you know, how do we actually guarantee that our training procedure in fact produces a model that is doing the thing that we want it to be doing. So how do we actually get a model that satisfies that training goal? That is, this is the sort of training rationale, this sort of understanding of why is it that our training process, you know, via all of the inductive biases, all of the ways that we've set it up, would in fact find an algorithm that is the sort of one that we, that we want it to be implementing. And then we have implementation competitiveness. Is it sort of in fact practical for us to run this procedure? Um, and we have this performance competitiveness. If we did run this procedure and we got the thing that is the thing we're trying to get, the, you know, the algorithm that we want, would that actually be able to satisfy the sorts of use cases that people want AGI and other sort of really powerful AI systems for? Okay, so these are the main criteria that we're gonna be looking at, the same ones that we sort of were talking about previously. Uh, and we've already talked about a couple of different sort of proposals uh, that we've looked at, you know, sort of understanding in these, these various lens. So we looked at microscope AI previously, this idea of you know, trying to extract insight from our systems via transparency tools, use that insight to improve human understanding, uh, and sort of iterate that way. Uh, so we're not going to recover this, but this is you know, one proposal we've already talked about here. And we've already talked about this sort of predictive models idea, the idea of, well, you know, we can try to take the, you know, these systems trained potentially to be just sort of predictive systems that are predicting some you know, particular camera and uh, you know, use those systems, condition them in various ways to get out useful information. So we've sort of already talked about these two. Um, one thing, though, that I think is sort of, you know, we'll separate these two proposals from a lot of the ones that we're going to talk about today, um, is that uh, a lot, as we sort of talked about last time with something like the conditioning approach, there's a point at which it breaks down. As you start sort of getting into systems where you're asking for very highly superhuman capabilities, you want your models to be able to do things that are substantially beyond what any human could possibly do. Um, being able to you know, successfully get those models to do the things that we want under the sorts of proposals that we talked about previously gets to be sort of quite tricky. So in the conditioning predictive models approach, we talked about how uh, it's quite plausible that you could sort of get a model to do something really useful and valuable that was just a predictive model, so long as you weren't asking for something that was sort of substantially beyond what any human would ever do. Because if you ask for something substantially beyond what any human would ever do, then the most likely you know, thing to predict that would do that would be you know, some AI system, which might not be safe. Um, and similarly with microscope AI, we talked about how you know, microscope AI might work really well when we're in a situation where the sorts of abstractions that the model learns are human-like abstractions. But if potentially you know, we keep pushing into a domain where we're trying to you know, get access to capabilities that are substantially beyond human level, we might sort of start to learn abstractions that are increasingly alien and, and difficult for us to understand and abstract and make use of. So we sort of have this key problem with a lot of the sorts of proposals we've talked about previously that they can struggle to generalize and work well substantially beyond the human level. And now that's not necessarily a problem with these approaches. I think that you know, any sort of strategy, you know, very general strategy for making use of all of these various different approaches that we have come up with is going to you know, presumably involve you know, multiple different approaches used at different times for different sorts of models. Um, but one of the, there's, there's clearly at least a sort of key problem, which is, well, eventually we're going to have to do something in this sort of you know, further regime. Um, 
And so we're sort of going to talk about this problem as this sort of scalable oversight problem. You know, how do we scale our ability to oversee models and ensure they're doing the right thing substantially beyond these sorts of human level capabilities? Question. Uh, in this Clear diagram here, where would you say we are now? Like we have models that are clearly not human level, but they seem to be superhuman in some domains, like AlphaGo is superhuman at Go. So we're on this curve, would you say, that modern systems tend to be? Yeah, I think that's a really tricky question. Uh, and I think it's you know, going to vary from system to system. I think that like, if we're thinking about like, in the conditioning predictive models approach, I think we're sort of you know, around this regime where the model's capabilities are just sort of you know, human level. Um, you know, many subhuman in most cases. You know, some places they can be super, you know, superhuman, but overall they're sort of like below the human level, and you know, certainly not superhuman. Um, you know, in Go, you know, there's cases where they are substantially superhuman. It's not clear whether their concepts are substantially superhuman, um, though they might be. In many cases, the sorts of concepts that these systems will learn are understandable to humans when we can extract them. Um, but it's really hard to do interpretability and actually understand what sorts of concepts these systems have. And so, you know, you could, for example, see that as very biased by our ability to actually extract things. You know, we can only oftentimes extract the things that we do understand. And so I think this is a really tricky question to answer. I'm not going to make some strong claim about exactly where different models stand on various different axes here. I think that um, one thing, the, the main thing that is clear is, well, we're, we're at the very least, we're not yet at like, you know, AGI, you know, systems that are, you know, fully general, can do all of the sorts of tasks that humans can do. We're certainly not there yet. Um, and we're definitely not at the you know super intelligent systems you know across the board yet. Um, and so, like at the very least, right now, I think that a lot of the sorts of you know approaches that we you know talked about previously, like predictive models, you know, focusing that sort of stuff, you know, does seem like you know totally applicable to current models and beyond current models at least for a substantial period. But eventually, we will presumably reach a point where that's no longer applicable. Now, we talked sort of you know about last time about you know one thing you might want to do with these sorts of systems, you know, and these sorts of approaches which sort of only work in the you know you know sub superhuman regime is maybe you know try to do things like additional AI safety research to make it easier to come up with other approaches that work in the in you know sort of path, you know regimes beyond that um, but that might not work you know it's very unclear and so you know it's worth you know trying to really delve into and understand you know what are things that we could do that would help us push you know our, our ability to align systems you know as, as far out as possible okay okay great so here's the sort of outline of some of the these are the approaches we're going to be talking about today uh, that we're going to try to get through we've got a bunch uh, there's more just beyond the ones that we're going to be talking about today, but these are, you know, some of the ones that I think are important to try to understand and, and work through. Um, and, you know, we'll sort of gesture at some, some others uh, at the end. Okay, so we're going to start with uh, amplification. And to do that, uh, we sort of need to uh, understand a particular preliminary, which is the concept of HCH. So HCH is a recursive acronym, and it stands for Humans Consulting HCH. So what is it? So we're going to have a human, uh, you know, just a normal human, and the human, you know, answers questions. So the human can take in a question and produce an answer. Uh, this is, you know, any situation where you can have a human answering questions. Um, and of course, you know, if you just did something like train a model to mimic a human answering questions, um, that might be, you know, safe in the same sense that we talked about with a predictive model, but it wouldn't, you know, necessarily be able to generalize to do anything beyond what a human would be capable of doing, uh, you know, safely. But we can sort of change this picture. So what if we give a human the ability to talk to two other humans? Well, now we've sort of taken the you know, human level capabilities and we've improved them. So now you know, it's the level of capabilities that are accessible to one human with access to the ability to talk to two other humans. Uh, and this you know, increases the capabilities and the sorts of tasks that the one human is able to answer. The sorts of questions that are uh, you know, available for this person to answer that they can do successfully is larger. Um, and we can iterate this procedure. We can give the, you know, the other humans uh, access to two more humans to talk to as well. Um, and, and we can sort of repeat this uh, to infinity. You know, we can say, well, what if you had the ability to theoretically you know, query additional humans and you know, be able to, you know, every single person in this entire tree had the ability to talk to additional humans. So we're going to call the sort of entire tree here, this you know, entire object of you know, humans with the ability to talk to as many additional humans as they possibly want all the way down the tree. We're going to call this HCH. And I haven't yet talked about how you know, this relates to any ability to you know, predict this thing or simulate it or uh, train a model on it. But the point is, this is a theoretical artifact. It is a thing that we could never build. 
uh, you know, or you know, maybe, maybe in theory, in some situations, if you had access to you know enough humans and or, you know the tree was small enough, maybe you could try to you know put a bunch of actual humans together. But for all intents and purposes, we're going to imagine this is a theoretical object that we can't you know in practice build, but that is in fact going to be relevant for understanding you know the approaches that we're going to talk about. Yeah, question. What's your best guess if we actually build this with humans? How well this would work in solving certain problems, and how much diminishing returns would we, we would get? My guess is that for most tasks, the force level is just making things worse. But okay, I don't know how to define most tasks and what time limits they have. Yeah, I think it's a really tricky sort of thing to understand. You know, we, is this good? You know, if you theoretically have this object, you had this thing that was just you know all of these humans talking to other humans all the way down the tree. Would you be happy? You know. Um, and that's sort of one of the key questions that we're going to be talking about because you know we're we're going to be talking about an approach that's trying to build something like this object. And so we want to understand, you know, one of the things we need to understand, you know, for like from an outer alignment perspective, right? Is if we actually got something that was like the thing we're trying to get, would we be happy? And I think the answer is very unclear. There's definitely some reasons that you might expect that this is a good thing. I think that you know the sort of standard argument for why you might like this is well, it's just human cognition, and we might you know believe that human cognition in many ways is sort of safer. Um, it's also sort of, in some sense, you can think of it as an approximation to sort of the you know, enlightened judgment of a human. If you imagine all of these humans sort of being the exact same human, uh, then you can think about this as, what if you had the ability to think about something for an arbitrarily long period of time by you know, consulting other copies of you? And maybe this is you know, better than like, if you had the ability to literally just think for a long period of time, because maybe you, know, you sort of start to go crazy after thinking for a million years. But if you have the ability to just delegate you know, to infinity all of the various different subtasks, to other copies of you, you know, in some sense, this is sort of you know what you would do if you really had the ability to effectively you know approach the problem you know from all possible angles. Um, but of course, there's other arguments as to why this might not be you know a good thing. You know, uh, an individual human only thinking for maybe a short period of time and answering a single question might not be able to do the sorts of really complex cognitive tasks that you know we might you know really need humans to do. There might be an accumulation of errors in various ways as you're sort of you know. Delegating and delegating and delegating and delegating. Um, there's a lot of various different things that you could imagine happening in this sort of an object. Yeah, question. What kind of um, assumptions do we make about the communication between those humans? So, how bossy is it? Yeah, that's a good question. I, there's sort of different variants of this object that will make different assumptions about you know what the communication is between the humans. Um, I think for our purposes, I want to basically imagine you know, each one of these arrows, you, know, you can essentially allow whatever communication you want, but that like, this human can't you know, go and talk to this human directly. Everything is factored through this sort of tree structure. Um, and there's other variants on this that sort of would depend on exactly how you set up your training procedure. But for our purposes right now, this is the sort of object we want to understand. Question. Uh, have people tried this with like, modern language models calling copies of themselves? And how well was that gone if they have? Uh, there have been some experiments that have looked at you know, some things like that. Um, there's various different you know, versions, iterations of this, depending on sort of how you think about that, uh, you know, what, what you think about that, that doing, and how you, how you sort of think it looks. Um, there's things like prompt chaining, and even just like chain of thought can sort of be thought of a version of this. I think that it's um, very unclear. Some things sort of work very well. Some things work very poorly. Um, I would say that in many ways, the sort of jury is still a little bit out on the extent to which this is sort of um, you know, effective, and I haven't. I, I think I also sort of want to defer that a little bit until I talk about what the actual training procedure is here, because I think that the actual training procedure here, though, um, the, you know, the way that you might actually want to train a model to approximate this object, is um, is actually quite similar to a lot of the ways in which we train current systems. So, um, but with a couple of modifications. So, we'll, well, I'm going to return to that in just a second. Right. And uh, what is prompt chaining and chain of thought? Yeah. So. Um, yeah, I really do want to want to want to return to this once I talk about the actual uh, model procedure. So why don't I? I'm going to I'm going to bin that this for just a second, and I'm going to return you know to trying to think about how this would actually you know play out once I once I explain the most basic training procedure for how you might want to approximate an object like this. Okay, so uh, right, so what is amplification? So this is another you know sort of uh, term of art here that's extremely important to understand how we're going to try to approximate this object. So we're going to say. You know, previously we have this object, this HCH object, where you know we have this you know human consulting humans all the way down this sort of massive tree. Okay, so now we're going to go back. We're just going to say, so suppose we have just a human. The human is doing question answering, um, and now instead of having access to two humans to query, they have access to two arbitrary objects. You know, uh, two models, for example. 
uh, you know, two AI systems that they can interact with and ask questions about. OK. In this procedure, we're going to call this situation, where the human has access to these two models, the amplified version of the model. So what does that mean? Well, the sort of idea here is whatever capabilities this model has, uh, by having multiple different copies of the model organized by the human with the ability to sort of query that, that model and sort of figure out how to interpret the results of what that model gives it, this is, results in a version of that model that is now more capable. Because you know, rather than just being able to do the things the model can do on a single query, it can do all of the things that it can do when organized by a human or across multiple queries integrated together. Um, and so we're going to call this procedure of taking a model, giving a human access to multiple copies of that model, the amplified version of that model. OK. And um, this is sort of only one amplification operator. There might be other ways in which you could take a model and amplify it. There might be sort of other amplification operators. But this is the most basic amplification operator that we're going to be talking about. It is an operator that acts on a model and results in a sort of another system that is able to answer questions in some way better than the original model. OK. And so concretely, the training procedure that I want to talk about here uh, that is sort of going to attempt to approximate this HCH object using this amplification operator uh, is fundamentally very simple. So what we're going to do is we're going to train some model to imitate the amplification operator applied to that model. So what does that mean? So we're going to say uh, you know, a human with access to that model, we're going to train the model to imitate that. Um, that's the most basic idea. We're going to throw on, uh, uh, yeah, actually, I don't want to talk about this quite yet. Um, so yeah, so let's just stop right here for a second. So the idea is we're going to train a model to imitate a human with access to that model. This is the most basic you know, uh, training procedure. Um, and so I, I promised I would return to sort of trying to understand how this works in the context of you know, thinking about uh, you know, concrete training procedures. Um, fundamentally, uh, oftentimes what you do if you take, uh, you know, we talked a bunch you know, previously about you know, language model pre-training, where we are in fact just taking a model and training it on a bunch of human text. In some sense, you can think about that as the sort of first iteration of this procedure, where you are just training on imitating a human. Rather than a human with access to a model, you're just taking a human straightforwardly. Um, now, what this is saying is it's saying, well, you know, if you're only training to imitate a human, then you can sort of only safely you know, go up to the level of you know, what a human would plausibly do. And this is sort of what we talked about last time, where if you just have a predictive model, and that model is just predicting what a human would do, or you know, across a possible distribution of possible agents, once you start asking for things that are beyond what any human would possibly do, you start to run into issues where now there's sort of no plausible human that would do that task, and instead you get other weird things like potentially uh, you know, an, an AI system doing that task. Um, and so in this case, we're like, well, you know, instead of just trying to predict humans, we can, do, we can try to predict something that we also think is safe, maybe, but that is sort of has the ability to maybe sort of go beyond the capabilities of what an individual human would do, which is a human with access to that model. And so um, you know, I think that one of the sort of key things here also is you know, how do we think about uh, you know, setting this sort of thing up? In some cases, like you were saying, one thing that you can do is you know, things like prompt chaining and uh, you know, where you're not necessarily having a human in a loop a lot of times. You know, maybe you just train the model to imitate a human. And then once you have a good human imitator, you try to set it up in you know, some sort of uh, you know, amplification scheme like this, where you have the model consulting other copies of the model in various different ways. Um, I'm not going to go into too much detail on what those sorts of setups might look like, but it is another option you know, that's sort of related to this, where instead of literally having a human in the loop, you could also you know, just train some system to imitate a human and then you know, replace the human with that. We're mostly just going to be imagining though, that we literally do have the human in the loop here, where that, you know, the thing that we're training on in this particular example is literally a human with access to our model. We've gotten a bunch of you know, uh, samples of what the human with access to our model would do, and then we're training to imitate those samples. OK, does so this setup make sense? I've you know, a little bit you know, talked about a lot of variations on this setup. I think it's very tricky because um, you know, I really want to talk right now just about something very specific. But there is a very large class of possible things that are related to this sort of idea that are you know, variations on it. And we're, and we're in fact even going to talk about some of the sorts of variations later on. But I think that this is in some sense the sort of most canonical, straightforward version of this style of approach. We're saying uh, you know, we want to imitate something that is more powerful than a human. The most basic, more powerful thing than a human that we might have access to is a human with access to our model. And so we're going to imitate that. OK. Now, you know, there are some sorts of issues that we obviously are you know, potentially going to run into when we're trying to do this. Uh, you know, the most basic issue is, well, 
there's a thing that we want to get, you know, our training goal. We want to get a model as a result of this that is in fact trying to imitate something like this HCH process. And we'll talk about why that might possibly be the case in a little bit. Um, but we might not get that, right? For all of the reasons that we've talked about previously, you know, we might get a deceptively aligned agent. We might get, you know, some other sort of weird type of system that is not doing the exact thing that we want. And so, you know, we'd like to at least have some sorts of, you know, understanding of how we can create safeguards and abilities to check and verify our models as we're training them. So one of the nice things that we have access to in this sort of a setup is we always have access to, at every individual point in training, we always have access to a sort of version of our model that is better than our current model, um, which is the amplified version of our current model. So at every individual point in training, you know, we're training some, some original model to imitate the amplified version of itself. Well, at every point in training then, we have access to an amplified version of the model that can serve as a sort of overseer. Uh, it can sort of throughout training say, you know, I'm, you know, actual make, act, make evaluations about how much, you know, the current model is in fact doing the right thing. Now, this is a very tricky thing to be doing, and we'll talk in a little bit about, you know, whether this might work or might not work. But the basic idea as to why this might be a reasonable thing to do is, well, we sort of have in this basic setup, we have a thing sitting around that in some sense is more powerful than our current model because it's the thing we're training our model to imitate. And, you know, maybe, you know, because it's more powerful than our current model in some sense, it can act as an overseer. It can, uh, you know, look at our model maybe with transparency interpretability tools, maybe with, you know, just by, uh, you know, trying to understand what it's doing by interacting with it and have some understanding of, you know, is the model essentially doing the right thing? Is it, you know, in fact being trained in the right way? Um, and so this sort of thing, uh, uh, we can sort of add this oversight where we have the amplified version of the model overseeing the training of the new model. Um, and in this case, we sort of have this intermittent oversight idea where, well, at each individual point in time, once we sort of trained our, uh, you know, one particular iteration of a model to imitate the amplified version of that model, we can, you know, get some new model and we can oversee it, you know, by using the amplified overseer to check, you know, do we like this new model? Question. Mike, somewhere. Yeah, okay. I'd like to ask what exactly we mean when we say imitative here and oversight. So how does the imitation process look like? Is it, uh, again, like, Reinforcement learning, but from AI feedback then, or like, yeah, or is it like inverse reinforcement learning? Um, yeah, perhaps add to that first and then deal with that theme. Yeah, so what does the imitation look like here is the question. So the basic idea is that um, I mean, there, there's a lot of different ways we could set this up. Right now, we're imagining something that is essentially just supervised, you know, fine tuning is the idea. We're saying you have some model, you can collect a bunch of data of a, what a human would do when answering questions given access to that model. That gives you a data set that then you can, you know, supervise fine tune on, that you can just train to imitate uh, that, you know, new data set. We'll talk um, in a little bit about a sort of variant on this idea where maybe instead of doing supervised fine tuning, you're doing something else like, um, you know, like RLHF or something like that. In this case, that's not what we're imagining. We're just imagining um, a situation where you're doing, you know, straightforward supervised fine tuning. We just gather a bunch of samples from the model interacting, you know, the, the human with access to the model, and then we, we, we train on those samples. Okay. And then the oversight part? Probably, yeah. Yeah, so what is the oversight here? So I think that that is maybe, maybe one of the most confusing bits here, because I think part of the problem with an approach like this is that and this is going to be a problem for basically all of the approaches we're going to talk about today. We don't really know what would go in that oversight step. I think that it's very unclear. I think that in some sense we can sort of acknowledge that some sort of oversight needs to be done, that it's very hard to be confident that this procedure is actually going to produce the sort of model that we want it to produce, and we'd like to be doing something to be overseeing that process to be checking whether it is doing the sort of, you know, it is in fact the sort of model we want. I think a key problem though is we don't actually know what sorts of things that an overseer could do that would make that verification possible. Um, you know, we can sort of speculate on some of the sorts of things we might want. You know, we want things like, you know, some sort of way to do, you know, transparency. To look inside the model, check, you know, what sort of things has it learned? Is it, is it, you know, doing the right sort of thing or the wrong sort of thing? You know, some ways to check, you know, is it deceptive, you know? I think the problem is that we don't really know what good means would be to check that. You know, one hope that you might have if you were just, you know, trying to go full steam ahead with an approach like this right now is, well, maybe the overseer, you know, the amplified version of the model will be smarter than us and it'll figure it out. But that's, of course, always a really tricky thing to rely on because, well, we don't know. You know, it might, you know, not be able to figure it out. <laughs> and so um, it's very unclear, um, you know, what, what that sort of oversight might entail right now. Cool. Okay. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about what this sort of, um, you know, the limit of this sort of procedure looks like, you know, why you might expect, you know, to get something like HCH or, you know, how it relates. So um, I want to sort of take a step back and 
Before we delve, you know, again into the sort of details of, you know, concretely, what if you actually ran this procedure? I want to take a brief moment to understand what is the theoretical limit of it, right? So if, in theory, you, you know, had this property that every single time you trained a system to imitate some other system, you actually got a copy of the system you're imitating, which, of course, as we know, is not true. You know, in fact, you just get, you know, the sort of mechanistically simple algorithm with a large basin, you know, that just that, you know, in fact, does a good job at fitting that that data. But you know, if we imagine that you actually did get a perfect imitation of the thing you're trying to imitate, what would we get? Um, and so we can take a look at this sort of you know, tree that we have here where we're taking some model, we train it to imitate the Amplified version of that model, we get a new model, and then we iterate this process. If we unpack this, what does it look like? Well, so again, you know, right, so we're going to imagine that you know, each imitation procedure you know, imitates perfectly, so all of these sorts of things here are directly equal. And then we can sort of unpack these ampl amplification operators, right? So you know, we have the individual model trained to imitate a human with access to that model. And now we get a new model, which we're going to assume is equivalent to the amplified version of the original model. And then we train you know, a new model to, you know, to uh, imitate the amplified version of that model, and so on. And so what we get is sort of this amplification operator applied over and over again. Um, and if we expand that out, what is one you know, application of the amplification operator? Well, it's a human consulting you know, the thing inside of that amplification operator. Um, and so then we can expand it out again and and again, and we see that we're starting to you know approach something like this HCH object, where you know if we think about what the theoretical limit of this sort of thing is, we're approaching something where we have a human consulting humans consulting humans. Um, now, of course, in any individual finite time, the you know the leaves of this tree are going to be whatever the sort of original model was that we started with, and not actual humans. Um, even you know in this sort of limiting case, that's still going to be true. Um, but this is the sort of idea, is that this procedure is in some sense um, in you know, some sort of theoretical limit of perfect imitation approaching something like this HCH object. And so the sort of thing that we might hope to get out of a procedure like this, you know, the sort of training goal, the algorithm that we might want, is something that is in fact just directly trying to imitate that HCH object. Um, and a model which was in fact just trying to directly imitate that HCH object would at the very least be consistent with the goal that we're training on. It would be you know, a model which do, does have good performance um, on this data. It would be you know, at the very least consistent with this. Now, we might not necessarily get it you know, because we don't have perfect imitation. There's lots of, sort of you know, potential issues here. But this is at least the sort of theory behind why you might like something like this. OK. And, and sort of how you might try to analyze you know, what, what can happen. Yeah, question. Or just to clarify, so this whole approach is a, a solution or a solution to outer line, right? Not inner line, because there's no guarantees about the inner properties of uh, the amplified models. Yeah, so we're going to talk in a little bit about, you know, if you were trying to, in fact, do this, if you were trying to do this thing where you imitate, you know, a human with access to the model, how would you, you know, feel about that from an outer line perspective, from an inner line perspective, all of these things? Um, Right now, when we're talking about this, just you know, how good would it be to, in fact, have HCH? That is just an outer alignment question, because it is just about this. You know, what is the actual thing that we want to get? And if we got that thing, what would it look like, and how would we like it? Right? If we're trying to understand the question of, if we actually got a system that was attempting to mimic HCH, would we like that system? That's an outer alignment question. Um, but we also do care about the inner alignment question here. You know, we, we, we do really care. You know, would we get this, right? There's no necessary guarantee that our system would in fact produce something that is trying to mimic you know, some sort of HCH process like this. There's lots of other things that it could be doing. And so you know, we do really want to understand you know, how likely is it to be doing all of those various different possible things. OK. OK, so let's try to go through this. So you know, we have this approach. Uh, so we can try to analyze it you know, on these sorts of criteria that we have. So uh, right, outer alignment. You know, we have this basic question, right? You know, the thing that we're trying to get is an HCH imitator. You know, we want a thing that is just sort of trying to mimic what this, HC, this sort of theoretical HCH process would do. Uh, and so if that's the sort of goal that we're trying to achieve here, we can just ask the question, well, would that thing be aligned? Uh, and like I was talking about previously, I think the answer is extremely unclear. Um, there's certainly some arguments that you can make for why it would be really good to have you know, a system like this. It's just human cognition. It's a lot of very powerful human cognition. Um, but there's lots of reasons why you might not think it's aligned. You know, in some sense, you know, one way I have I have heard this sort of HCH process described before is the infinite bureaucracy. You know, in some sense, we have you know layers upon layers of you know various different humans interacting with other humans. Um, you know, that sort of thing might go wrong in various different ways, in the same sorts of ways that you know standard bureaucracies might go wrong, um, or it might go very right. Um, I think it's very unclear. Um, you know, how to interpret you know what this sort of theoretical object um, would do, how much we would like it. But that is the thing we're trying to get. Um, OK, but then of course we have the question, you know, would we actually be able to get it? Um, and it's very, very unclear. 
um, you know, this sort of you know, question as well. So we at least have something that we're trying to do here, right? Which is, well, we have at each individual point in time, we can do this oversight where we have you know, the amplified version of the model you know, providing some you know, ability to look at the model being trained and sort of you know, say, well, you know, is this doing the right thing? Um, but like I said previously, it's very unclear what that model would be doing uh, you know, and whether that would be sufficient. Um, and in particular, I think that one thing that's sort of really important to point out here is just because it is the case that the amplified model is in some sense sort of you know, stronger than the original model, you know, it, is, you know, it is sort of more capable, we, we think, because it is multiple copies of that model organized by a human, doesn't mean that it is better uh, at the task of understanding what a model would be doing than the original model is at you know, something you know, like hiding that, uh, you know, what it's doing. Or even if it's not hiding what it's doing, it's very unclear how that capability of understanding what another model is doing scales as we do this procedure. There's no reason necessarily to believe that just because a model is in some sense more capable is, uh, you know, means that it is going to satisfy the threshold of being able to successfully interpret and understand the, you know, the original model. Um, that's a potentially very high threshold. And there's a sort of offense-defense balance parent, uh, you know, sort of question here. If we're imagining you know, the model being trained is potentially deceptive um, and you know, maybe potentially trying to hide the fact that it's deceptive from you know, the amplified version of the model. Well, there's a lot of things they can do to pretty you know, successfully achieve that. One thing that it can do is, well, you know, it is the model being amplified. And so it can just you know, you know, act in such a way in that amplification process to not help us in trying to understand what the original model being trained is doing. Um, and even if in some sense we do have the ability to get it to in doing the oversight, in fact, be really trying to help us doing the oversight, we still have the issue that it may just be easier for a model to hide uh, from checks than it is for us to produce checks that find and understand what it's doing. We don't really know what that balance looks like, what the sort of balance looks like between how easy it is to understand you know, and figure out what models are doing and try to you know, fix them, as opposed to how easy it is for you know, models uh, you know, to hide from that, or even just how easy it is for gradient descent to obfuscate things and you know, to what extent gradient descent does that by default. And so understanding that balance is extremely tricky and it's very unclear whether we'd be able to, you know, to what extent this sort of oversight mechanism would help at all. Um, we can, of course, you know, also ask other questions. We can be like, well, even if the oversight mechanism doesn't help, we can do the same sort of inductive bias analysis that we talked about previously and just ask, well, by default, you know, how likely would we be to in fact get an HCH imitator? But then, of course, that question is also very tricky because we don't know, you know, how you know, plausible that sort of a model would be you know, on these sorts of inductive biases. We don't know exactly what the inductive biases would look like. And so making a case here that this thing would work, I think, is um, very tricky. Um, but it's not, you know, certainly I think there's, you know, we could imagine a situation where we have a lot more knowledge and understanding of how this might go, where we could make a really strong case this would work. Questions? Yeah, question. Um, the, so for the oversight step, like, suppose that we do, we do this HH with intermittent oversight, and it just turns out that, like, yep, like, the fourth iteration is always super evil and misaligned. What do we do? Ah, uh, it's a really good question. I think that one sort of thing that's a little bit tricky about this approach, and, and this is sort of, I, I'm glad you asked this question because I think it'll sort of segue nice into the next approach, which is that um, there is sort of an issue here, you know, where we have this, they have this setup where we're doing this sort of, you know, intermittent checks. Uh, but if those checks fail, it's very unclear what we do next. You know, in some sense, we have evaded the problem of training a, you know, thing that was very dangerous, but we haven't necessarily, you know, satisfied our sort of competitiveness burden of actually producing a model that was, that was safe and is able to do the things. Now, we'll, we'll talk about one way in which you could, you know, modify this procedure very slightly to potentially try to address that problem, though that modification will also introduce its own sort of host uh, of, of issues. Um, so I'm going to punt on that a little bit until next time. I think right now you can sort of, sort of imagine, well, if it, it turns out that things work, then at the very least we get a mulligan, right? We get another chance. We get a chance to be like, okay, this didn't work. Let's back up and try something else. And, and maybe that lets us, you know, salvage our position. Okay. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the competitiveness burden that we have to deal with here. So we have this implementation competitiveness. You know, is it in fact, uh, you know, competitive to do this training procedure? I think that one thing that is sort of nice going for us here is that this basic procedure of you know, just doing you know, supervised fine tuning on you know, data of you know, humans with access to models is a very straightforward thing for us to do with you know, current systems. This is the thing that we do know how to do. You know, we, can, we do all the time where we collect a bunch of data of humans interacting with models. We can collect large question answering data sets. We can you know, effectively fine tune on them. And so this is something that you know, is sort of within the scope of the sorts of things that we can sort of imagine in fact implementing. Um, so that's nice. Um, and again, we also have the performance competitiveness burden. You know, is it in fact the case that HCH, if we actually got a thing that was trying to imitate HCH, would be capable of doing the sorts of things that we wanted to do? 
Uh, and then this is also very unclear. So we talked previously about this sort of question of, well, you know, is it in fact sufficient? You know, if you have a bunch of humans, you know, taking some, you know, small amount of time to answer individual questions, and you put them all together into this massive sort of tree, you know, can they, you know, work together to effectively answer really complex questions? Um, and I think we don't know. I think it's very unclear. You know, it may be the case that, you know, for humans to really effectively do, you know, powerful cognitive work, they really need to think about things for a long extended period of time in a way that is, you know, can't sort of successfully be factored into all of these sort of individual calls. Um, or it may be the case that, you know, that's not true, that we actually can factor things effectively, that, you know, an H stage would actually be able to answer all of these sorts of things. Um, I don't think we really know the answer to that question um, definitively. Um, I think that, you know, probably the way that it, uh, you know, in fact works out is that it's going to be okay at some tasks and not as good at other tasks. And so then the question will become, how does this fit into some sort of, you know, broader portfolio of when we want to use various different approaches versus other approaches? So, you know, we've talked previously about things like predicting, mo you know, predictive models and microscope AI is various different approaches that might help us, you know, make individual, you know, models with different levels of capabilities on individual tasks, you know, safe, uh, you know, in those particular situations. I, I, you know, I think probably a similar thing is going to happen here, where, you know, it is not in fact going to be the case that HCH is going to be able to solve all of your problems. There probably will be things where HCH is not very good. Uh, but if you, in fact, were able to successfully get HCH, you know, imitators as, as a result of this training procedure, I think there would be at least a bunch of tasks that you would be able to then safely do that you couldn't do previously. Question. So is something like a better way of putting, is HCH sufficiently universal to perform all the tasks for which you might want AGI? Would a better way of putting this be something like, can HCH perform all the tasks that other AGIs we know how to build would do. Because like competitiveness is based on what we can currently do, right? If HCH was the strongest AI available, even if it couldn't do everything we might want, it would still be competitive by default. Yeah, so I think that uh, that's a really good point. It is absolutely the case that we are comparing against, you know, in fact, what other things we could plausibly build. Um, Though I will point out that, you know, in many cases, you know, one of the sorts of things we started this talk with, right, was we want to understand, you know, how could we come up with systems that will be able to, you know, make things aligned off, you know, into the future as we start getting into situations where, you know, some of the approaches we talked about previously, you know, start to break down, right? And, you know, again, we're seeing that, well, this sort of approach might also break down at some point. You know, there's some, there's a limit to, you know, at least it seems like there's probably some limit to what H stage can do and what H stage you know, can't do. And so even if this approach worked perfectly, there would still be situations where you know, it wouldn't work, but maybe it can extend that frontier a little bit. You know, we can go a little bit further than what we were previously able to, able to do into the you know, regime of things that are only achievable you know, safely via something like this. Maybe, I mean, that depends on all of these sorts of interalignment stuff working out as well, that we can actually successfully do this imitation task, that we actually get something which is in fact trying to imitate H stage, et cetera, et cetera. But, um, so, you know, and again, like I said previously, also, you know, in many cases, it's okay if some of these sorts of proposals are, you know, only competitive in various different particular situations, because we don't know what sort of situation we're going to find ourselves in. And in fact, we're likely to find ourselves in many situations, because as our AIs get more and more capable, and as we deploy them in various different situations on different tasks, we're going to need to continuously ensure that each of one of those sorts of things is aligned and, and you know, doing the right thing. And so there may be different approaches which make more sense in different situations. Okay, so we have this approach. We have, uh, you know, HCH with intermittent oversight. I mentioned previously that, um, you know, well, there is sort of a core problem here, uh, you know, among many, but one core problem is this issue of, well, what happens if the intermittent oversight fails? Uh, you know, what do we do? Is there some approach where we really like this approach? We think the intermittent oversight is actually a really effective tool, but we want to, you know, be able to use the intermittent oversight not as just sort of a check, but as a way to effectively change our, you know, the way that we're training our model to, in fact, you know, fix any misalignment that we discover. Um, so the next thing we're going to talk about is an approach that is sort of trying to do that, which is this sort of imitative amplification plus relaxed adversarial training. So the idea here is relatively straightforward. So previously, the thing that we were doing was just training on imitating what the amplified version of the model would do. Now we're going to add in an extra thing to train on, which is, well, we want to train on making it the case that the amplified version of the model says, you know, A-OK -okay to the model being trained. So previously, we're sort of only doing this extra check. You know, we had on top, we had this amplified version of the model sitting around. You know, we thought it might work well as an overseer to sort of help guide the training process. And previously, we were doing this sort of as an extra check. And now we're like, well, you know, what if we just directly train on the objective of making it so that the, you know, our model passes the check? Okay, so this is in some sense a really powerful thing to do and also a really scary thing to do. Um, it's really powerful because now we can sort of really, you know, much more effectively guide the training of our model based on what our overseer sort of wanted to be doing. 
Um, but it's also a scary thing to do because you know, we might end up you know, finding something that technically meets the specifications of what the overseer is looking for, but in fact is doing something really you know, problematic in a way that we don't want. Um, because we've sort of explicitly optimized our model to look good to us. Uh, and things that look good you know, to the amp flight overseer might not actually be good. And so we're sort of, um, you know, we, we, this is a sort of trade off that we make if we try to go down you know, something like this. Yeah, question. So if we are using amp m to police amp m, what's to stop it from just cooperating with other copies of itself and telling us that everything's fine? Like we don't trust humans to oversee themselves for obvious reasons. Yeah, so I think this is a really key question here, uh, especially in this sort of approach. I think that the basic thing that you might hope is that maybe you can catch things that sort of are prior to the point at which your model becomes you know, able to you know, and, and wanting to sort of cooperate against you in that way. So if you have a situation where um, you know, you're trying to look for, you know, your, your Amplified Overseer is trying to look for things like, is the model you know, um, non-myopic? Does it have some non-myopic objective across time horizons? You know, these sorts of things we talked about previously are like necessary for deceptive alignment to arise. If you had your Amplified Overseer looking for things like that, then you might expect that, well, you know, by the time it became deceptive and was in fact trying to fool us and trick us or whatever, and you know, would cooperate against us in overseeing, um, yes, we would, you know, things would not go well. But hopefully we can avoid ever ending up in that situation because the training process is now such that you know, at any individual point in time, if we start to develop the sorts of things in our model that would be necessary for that model to eventually become deceptive, then we'll you know, train them away. Because the overseer will see them, will be like, this is bad, and that will create a training signal that will push it away from that sort of basin, right? So that's the sort of idea here, I think, is that yes, if it is in fact the case that you end up with a model and that model is you know, deceptive and you're trying to get the deceptive model to oversee itself, it won't, it's not going to work because you know, the deceptive model is just going to be like nothing to see here. Um, but of course, you know, there is something that we can do, which is what well, we can try to you know, intervene prior to that point. We can try to say, well, there are other things that we might try to look for in the model that we don't want the model to be doing, uh, such that you know, if we can ensure that the model is not doing those things, then we know it'll never become deceptive. Then we can sort of end up in the right path. You know, you can think about this as like, well, you know, if, if, you know, if your model just like starts out, you know, really helpful and is really trying to do the right thing, and um, then there's sort of, you know, an equilibrium where, you know, a helpful model, if it starts to see, you know, the model being trained starting to go in a non-helpful direction, will correct it and say, no, this is the wrong thing to do, go back in the right direction. Um, but of course, there's another equilibrium where if your model is, you know, totally deceptive and it's trying to trick you, then it's going to make sure that the model stays, you know, trying to trick you. And so in some sense, we can sort of think about what this is doing as an equilibrium sort of selection problem, where there's like two basins. There's, this, there's the one where you know, the helpful, you know, useful, you know, uh, aligned model you know, keeps it in the aligned basin. And there's the you know, deceptive model that keeps it in the deceptive basin. And we're saying, well, you know, each, one of, each one of those basins would individual be, individually be you know, a good final solution. But maybe you know, if, as long as we start out sort of approximately on the right path, we can guide ourselves into the sort of basin that we want rather than the one that we don't want. Uh, by using, you know, the overseer, right? So if we start out with an overseer that is reasonably aligned in some various different ways, it's, you know, kind of ish trying to do the right thing, then we can sort of continuously push the, in that direction. And of course, you know, the overseer in this case is not just a model, right? It's a human with access to the model. And so we have some reason to believe, you know, that especially if that human is, you know, doing some real important work, that it's, you know, keeping things approximately, you know, along towards the right basin because the human is, you know, trying to, you know, look for the sorts of things that we actually want it, you know, to be looking for. Okay, but of, but of course I think that this is like a very, very sketchy thing to be doing. I think that there's a lot of reasons you might like this, and in fact this is you know approach I have, have thought a lot about, and I think it's you know, a pretty reasonable thing to do, but it's also very, very tricky because you know, you're in this sort of situation where you have to believe that you're actually gonna end up in the, you know, the right sort of equilibrium here. Yeah, question. Also, if we are like automating some of these adversarial attacks, then wouldn't it be like, for instance, let's say we're testing for non-myopia. The only way that AMP-M could check for non-myopia is if AMP-M understands the concept of non-myopia. It has to understand the concept of giving up reward now to get reward later in order to check to see if a copy of itself is doing that. Yeah, I think that when I say like check for something like does it have a long-term goal, we expect that even systems that don't have long-term goals will at least understand the concept of a long-term goal, right? Um, I think that that's going to be really hard to not have. I mean, in many ways, I think many current like language models, you know, can understand the basic concept of a long-term goal. Um, 
And so that's going to be a pretty hard thing. If, if that's the thing you're looking for, is like, OK, we want the model to not even know what a long-term goal is, I think that's going to be a really hard thing to make work in this case. But maybe there are other things, like whatever it means to, in fact, not have a long-term goal, uh, you know, that you could effectively you know, try to verify via a scheme like this. OK, so we're going to try to analyze this, you know, again, you know, relatively quickly, you know, but, but using the same sort of criteria. So you know, again, we have this outer alignment. You know, here, we're still trying to produce something that is imitating each stage. That's sort of still the goal here. Uh, and so the outer alignment question is very similar. Um, we do need it to be the case that the, like, you know, all of the sort of checks that we're doing uh, are consistent with the H stage imitator. If there's no H stage imitator that would pass any of our checks, then we're sort of in trouble here. Um, but you know, as long as that's the case, you know, again, the sort of thing that we want is just this H stage imitator. It's the same sort of story previously. Um, and then the inner alignment question, of course, I, I already talked about this, but you know, we have this sort of key question of can the overseer, you know, can the amplified version of the model that is you know, overseeing this training effectively you know, push it in the right direction, right? You know, can it you know, oversee it in such a way where if we train the model to pass that oversight, pushes it towards you know, the right basin and not the wrong basin? And this is a really tricky thing, but you know, there are some things that we might try, right? Like you know, trying to you know, verify things that are precursors to deception that help us you know, push away from ever entering into this sort of deceptive basin. OK. Uh, and then again, implementation competitiveness is very similar here, except with the sort of key issue of, well, now we have to actually do this oversight you know, continuously without training, uh, you know, throughout training. And so if that oversight is potentially very expensive, you know, if our transparency tools you know, or whatever our overseer is doing to try to understand the model are very expensive and difficult for us to operate, um, you know, that could be sort of potentially an issue here. Um, uh, you know, so, so we need to, you know, to be in some, in some way that we can sort of automate those, those sorts of tools effectively. Um, and then we have, you know, again, the sort of same, uh, essentially the same performance competitiveness question because we're still trying to get something that is basically just imitating HCH. Yeah, question. So for this idea, is the idea to simply have like a negative thing we try to avoid or a positive thing we try to aim towards? And if it's a positive thing we try to aim towards, how do we differentiate between the thing we want and do the thing that looks like the thing we want? Yes, I think this is a really good question. I think that it's very unclear. I think that it seems like you know, it's going to be easier to try to have an overseer which is looking for some positive quality rather than negative quality because um, you know, it, it can be really tricky to, to look for a negative quality because now there's like all of these very different possible ways in which a thing could be false and there's sort of maybe only one way for a thing to be true. Um, but like you say, you know, positive qualities can be quite tricky because then it's like, well, how do we differentiate from it looking like that and actually doing that? You know, the hope here would be something like, well, you know, the overseer is better at doing this differentiation than us. Um, it may have access to a bunch of you know, tools to be able to look at and inspect models internally, and that could help it do this evaluation more effectively. Um, but at the end of the day, I think that's a core you know, concern, right? It is just, in fact, not clear that it would actually be the case that in this sort of a situation, we would, you know, the overseer would actually be able to effectively distinguish between the model looking like it's doing the right thing and actually doing the right thing. Um, and that's sort of one of the key differences, right? You know, one of the things that might make you skeptical of this approach as opposed to the previous one is that now, you know, we're sort of introducing additional optimization pressure against the overseer, right? We're sort of directly optimizing for the overseer, things to look good to the overseer. And if look good to the overseer is very different than what we actually want, um, that, you know, that could cause some, that could cause some serious issues. Um, but of course, it also has benefits over the previous one because now, you know, the previous one, you know, it just, you know, could, you know, fail and then we have no recourse. But here, you know, we have some way to actually sort of address the issue. Okay, okay. Um, all right, so we have those two approaches, which are these sort of both based on the imitative amplification idea. They're both trying to say, well, you know, we want to imitate this amplification operator. You know, we want to imitate this HCH sort of, you know, process. Um, there's lots of other things though as well. So I'm next thing I want to talk about is sort of a variant on this sort of amplification idea. But now we're sort of not going to be using imitation. We're doing something else instead. And I think that in many ways we sort of talked previously about something like uh, you know reinforcement learning from human feedback, uh, and this is going to be very similar to sort of how you might think about a sort of scaled up um, reinforcement learning from human feedback approach. Uh, but we're going to call it approval-based amplification. So what does this mean? Well, here's their approach. So we're going to say uh, again we sort of have a model. We have the amplified version of the model, which is like a human with access to that model, and we're going to train the model uh, on uh, not uh, previously, we, we were sort of training the model on imitating the amplification uh, 
uh, ver amplified version of that model. But now, rather than trying to imitate it, we're going to try to maximize its approval. So the amplified version of the model has some you know, uh, uh, extent to which it approves of what the model is doing. It can you know, give reward, right? It can see an individual sample from that model, and it can say, you know, I like this sample, I don't like this sample. In the same way that uh, you know, some sort of reinforcement learning free human feedback approach would work, where you can take samples from the thing, you can score those samples, and you can you know, train the model to have high scores according to the, you know, the, the, the sort of score giving procedure. Um, and in this case, the score giver here is rather than just a human, uh, it is you know, this amplified version of the original model. We're saying, well, you know, a human can only give scores that are so good. You know, at some point, you know, the scores given by a human will stop being very effective because uh, there's a limit to the sort of ability of a human to over, you know, effectively oversee you know, and understand whether you know, a sort of individual thing that a model has done is good or bad. But maybe the amplified version of the model is better, right? The human with access to the model itself can do a better job of being able to oversee and understand whether the model did a good job or not. And so we're going to say, you know, we're going to take the model and we're going to train it on maximizing the approval of the amplified version of the original model. Um, and then, you know, while we're at it, we can sort of also, you know, one of the other things that we want to have as part of the approval here is the same sort of relaxed adversarial training that we talked about previously. In some sense, these are basically the exact same thing. It is just the overall approval of the amplified version of the model. But you know, it's important to emphasize that one of the things that we would like to be contained in that approval signal is the extent to which the amplified version of the model actually believes that the model it's, you know, being trained is doing the right thing you know, internally with whatever you know, oversight tools, you know, transparency tools we might have access to. We want it to, in fact, you know, be, be actually doing the right thing. Uh, you know, to the greatest extent possible they're able to verify. Um, and so that's the idea here, is that you know, now instead of training to imitate the, the sort of Amplite Overseer, now we're training to maximize the approval of the Amplite Overseer directly, um, you know, including all of the same sort of relaxed adversarial training um, that we talked about uh, previously. Question. So when we've looked at like maximizes, maximization for existing systems, like the mm -hmm. thing that most looks like a dog to a dog neuron, or the sentence that is most likely to result in the next token, we tend to end up with these alien looking images or these alien looking sentences. What makes us think that maximizing the approval of AMM won't lead to the same thing? Yeah, so it's extremely unclear. It totally could lead to some really weird things. So some evidence as to reasons why you might not. Um, well, so RLHF, you know, in fact, doing this with current humans, where we just, we, we don't amplify the human, you know, we don't do some amplification at all, we just have a, an individual human with access to nothing doing the evaluation, um, does often yield models which sort of look like they're doing the right thing. Um, now, they might not, in fact, be doing the right thing, and we talked previously about, you know, how do we actually understand these models, you know, with something like the RLHF conditioning hypothesis, but in many ways, you know, they at least look like they're sort of doing the right thing, um, because, you know, we've trained them to look like they're doing the right thing. Um, if they, you know, in fact, look like they're doing something really weird, you know, uh, alien thing, then, well, you know, unless that really weird alien thing looked good to humans, then, you know, hopefully, you know, it, it wouldn't be incentivized by this process. Um, of course, there's the sort of key issue of it might be doing some really weird alien thing that looks good to humans, but is really not the thing that we wanted, right? It's doing internally some very strange algorithm, you know, something that is really not the sort of thing that we wanted it to be doing, but that still nevertheless looks good to, to the humans. The hope here, as opposed to just doing something like vanilla RLHF, would be, well, maybe you know, the amplified version of the human is better at being able to understand and evaluate what the model would do than, than just, or the amplified version of the model, you know, the human with access to the model, is better at doing that evaluation than just a vanilla human or just a vanilla model, right? Then now we have this ability to, for the human you know, doing the evaluation to query the model and use the model itself to help it do that evaluation. So maybe now it's harder to trick the human, it's harder to find weird edge cases where the, you know, the evaluation is no longer effective, um, and so maybe it sort of works in, in, in situations where the you know, RLHF would not. That's the, sort of, that's the sort of hope of you know, why you might like something like this. Yeah, question. How would we take the first step? So my impression is that the level of subhumans that AI we have now with GPT, mm -hmm. now I don't think that a human with GPT can do a better work at RLHF, significantly better work than just in humans alone. So for this amplification process to work, we need to get to some initial level where the model can already have the human. And I would imagine, but at that point, it's, it might already get scary. I don't know. Yeah, so I think I basically 100% agree with what you just said, which is this sort of, you know, only starts to, uh, you know, matter as we start to get into the regime where, you know, um, the model is actually, in fact, helpful for the human doing the evaluation. Um, and I absolutely agree that things could start to get scary, you know, as you start to get into that regime, you know, before this really becomes relevant. 
Um, as we talked about at the beginning, a lot of the approaches that we're going to be talking about today are really trying to deal with the question of, well, you know, as we start to get into those further capabilities regimes, what do we do, right? So when you're in the sort of earlier capabilities regimes where you're just dealing with models, you know, that are, you know, that, uh, that are just like predictive models, then we can, you know, maybe address them in other ways, right? We can try to understand, you know, just conditioning them well, making sure they're doing safe things. But as we start to get into regimes where they're getting more and more capable, we need to have other approaches that can help us, you know, deal with the, you know, more and more capable models. And so that's sort of one of the things that we might hope to be doing here. Um, in some sense, this is sort of like I said, where this approach just sort of collapses down to something like vanilla, you know, RLHF, when you're in a situation where the model is not at all helpful for doing the valuation. But as the model does become helpful for doing the valuation, maybe this helps you do that evaluation more effectively. And so we're saying, well, this can sort of help you scale up things uh, as you sort of start to get into that regime. Um, Maybe. I mean, it's very unclear, right? You know, it may be the case that, um, you know, it doesn't help. You know, it could even be the case that it hurts. You know, maybe the, you know, in some, in some cases, you know, the model, uh, you know, like we were saying previously, if like the model is deceptive or something like that, it can, you know, hurt your ability to evaluate the model because it can, you know, sabotage the human evaluation because the model doesn't want to be evaluated, you know, effectively. And so there's all sorts of ways in which things could go very strange here. Um, you know, it could just be the case that right now that because we're training on this, you know, particular evaluation signal, we just, you know, good heart the evaluation signal by, you know, finding some very strange, you know, solution that technically looks good, but in fact is doing something really weird. So there's a lot of ways in which this could fail, but the basic idea is that we're trying to take that, you know, simple, you know, evaluation signal that an individual human produced and make it, make it better, make it, you know, potentially able to scale beyond that. Okay, question. So I think I've misrepresented my question from earlier. So you made basically mentioned that, you know, if amp M is if amp M is basically going off what it imagines a human would want, then that's a good thing. But I guess what I'm saying is, let's take the dog example again. If you try and maximize what kind of dog looks good to a human, what you probably get is this incredibly adorable looking golden retriever or something. But if you try and maximize what looks good to a language to a an image model that can very well di differentiate dogs from other things, you end up with this psychedelic set of dog heads. So it seems like if MM is able to understand the human's preferences perfectly and even do better, then AMP1 is M1 is safe. But it feels like a huge amount of the difficulty is actually getting from M to AMP M in the first place when AMP M is just not going to be the same as the human at the extremes. That's sort of what I'm suggesting. Yeah, I mean, I think that the I think this is absolutely valid criticism. It is definitely the case that you know AMP M. I mean, so it is important to understand, right? AMP M is not just HCH, right? It's not like the overseer here is just like the perfect. It's just a bunch of humans. There's no models, right? Like at each individual point in time in training, the overseer that we actually in fact have is just a human with access to the model, and that is going to inherit all of the sorts of weirdness of whatever the model is that we currently have to give to the human, and that can absolutely introduce some really strange effects that can sort of make this tricky. And so that's, you know, that's why I think it's important to understand that the overseer, right, is, it is amp M. It is not, you know, anything more powerful than amp M or anything weaker than amp M. It is just, you know, it is the best that we can do. It is the human with access to the best, you know, model that we have as, you know, so far in training. Oh, there is a human in the loop at every step. There is a human in the loop at every step here, right. but it's not an infinite tree of humans in the loop at every step, right? It is just a human in the loop with every step with access to whatever the best model is that we have. Yeah. Question. I don't know how relevant this is, but why is the the same thing, the same model um, um, up and down? Like, why don't we, like, where, where men we are worried about these cooperating with each other, the overseer robot and the uh, trained robot? Why don't we try to train two classes of robots, one that we actually want to use, then one that is specialized for helping the human in oversee? I don't know how that would work, but it is more natural. Uh, so I think you could do this. Uh, you totally could train a separate overseer robot than, or you know, overseer AI than the AI that you're training, you know, individually. There's some reasons why you might not want to do that. Most, one, maybe the most obvious reason is like, well, now you have to train two AIs, and if an individual training run is, you know, extremely expensive, that could be a really large uh, competitiveness hit. Um, there's also, you know, something that we started this out, you know, with, which is like, well, there's some nice property, which is in some sense, in each individual point, the overseer, like, is the target of the training, right? Like, we believe that the overseer is stronger than the model being trained because the overseer is the amplified version of the model being trained. And, you know, if we didn't have that guarantee, then maybe we'd be less likely to believe that the overseer is actually going to be able to provide effective oversight. Um, now, I think that that guarantee, it's, it's, like I said previously, it's not an actual hard guarantee. Like, it may be the case that the overseer is in some sense stronger, but in some sense, you know, uh, the task of oversight is hard enough that that doesn't matter. 
Um, so it's not, it's not a hard guarantee, but you know, it's, it is maybe a nice property that we want to try to leverage here. OK, so again, we can sort of go through the same sort of analysis. So one thing that I sort of want to you know, talk about very briefly is um, you know, we've talked a lot about HCH, and I think it's natural to sort of take something like this approval-based amplification process and assume that it must also limit to HCH. But I think an important thing to keep in mind um, is, well, you know, all that we did is we just trained on you know, the amplification operator. And previously, we had this you know, argument that, well, when we were doing imitation, the training on imitating the amplification operator you know, limits to something like HCH. But I want to point out, because I think this is really important, that when you're doing something like approval-based amplification, um, that's not the case. So what is the limit of approval-based amplification? Well, so you know, unpacking it, we have a human, and that human gets to consult two models, right? That's the individual uh, you know, thing that we're trying to uh, you know, maximize the approval of. This is one model amplified, right? This is the amplified version of them. Um, and then what we do is we train another version, uh, uh, you know, another model, to maximize the approval of you know, human consulting uh, M, right? Uh, and we sort of iterate this procedure. And you can think about what's sort of happening here as a sort of infinite chain, uh, you know, infinite sort of tree like HCH. But pre previously, we had this sort of property that as each individual sort of amplification operator expanded, each one of these models in the limit should be equivalent to the sort of human thing that it's, that it's sort of training because it's just imitating it. But that's not the case anymore. Now it's just maximizing the approval. So instead of these sorts of you know, direct tree of humans, we have a tree of sort of human model things, each imitating each other, or sort of maximizing the approval of each other. So in some sense, you can sort of think about it as, well, it's like a human consulting a model such that that model maximizes the approval of a human consulting models that maximize the approval of human consulting models, and so on. Um, and this is a really weird object. Right? So I think that that's worth sort of pointing out, is that the, the limit here is no longer something really nice and easy to understand. Now, it's very unclear right? like, you know, how much we care about the limit, right? because it's not the case that we actually even get the limit. Right? So previously, you know, we talked about how, well, there's this nice theoretical object of HCH, but we don't actually know whether we're going to get anything that looks like the theoretical HCH object in practice. And of course, we don't know what we're going to get in practice here as well. But it is at least worth pointing out that the limit here is much more messy. Right? We no longer sort of should expect that HCH is sort of a plausible thing that we could get. Now we're getting something much weirder. We're getting this you know, tree of approval maximization. Question? Uh, in the last talk, you talked about the sort of RLHS conditioning hypothesis, which was just that like doing or training a language model to do RLHF is basically almost equivalent to fine tuning and fine tuning got some prompts. So, I mean, in the same sense, could you say that, like, maximize model M, maximize the approval of, like, amplified M, or would itself also sort of, could, could that be a sort of conditioning thing too? Or so, could, in a sense, could this, like, practically be equivalent to HCH? So I think that you absolutely can apply the sort of RLH of conditioning hypothesis if it is true to this situation. But even in that case, I don't think it would be well described as HCH. Because in that case, what you would be thinking about this as would be saying, well, it's a human consulting the model where the model is the conditional, such that when applied to the pre-training distribution, results in the best approval according to the, the rest of the tree. And that's still a really weird object, right? Like it's a little bit hard, easier to understand because it's no longer you know, the case that it's just sort of like whatever the model would be that maximizes approval. Now it's sort of a smaller class. It's whatever the conditional would be that maximizes approval. But there's still no reason to believe that that conditional is you know some sort of imitation thing, right? Um, you know, it is often you know, and in fact, you know, we probably shouldn't expect that, right? Like you know, if I'm giving approval to a thing, I'm not necessarily going to say the thing that is most you know, approved by me is literally me, right? Maybe, you know, maybe that's plausible, but most of the time that's probably not going to be the case. And so, um, you know, I think that we shouldn't, you know, even, even in the case where the RLHF conditioning hypothesis is true, we still shouldn't think of the limit of this procedure as something like H to H. It, it is something much weirder. OK, so I think this is just important to sort of understand what this approach is doing. Um, so again, we can sort of, you know, try to work through these sorts of same questions previously. So we have the outer alignment question. And the outer alignment question here is, is quite weird because it is the question of, well, the thing, what is the thing we're trying to get? I think in some sense, the thing we're trying to get is this sort of limit. It's this sort of tree. We're trying to say, well, we want the thing that is just sort of, in fact, has the best approval according to, you know, what, um, you know, this sort of amplified version of the model, you know, going all the way down, you know, would say. Um, but that's a really weird thing to understand. So you know, to make that good, we really have to be the case that at each individual point along the process, we're really verifying that you know, uh, we believe that the thing that would maximize the approval of the overseer at that individual point in time would actually be something that we'd be happy with. That the overseer is going to be effective at being able to successfully oversee and give good feedback, uh, you know, be able to understand if the model is doing something bad, then it gives you know, negative feedback. And if it's doing something good, it gives positive feedback. Um, 
you know, at any individual point in time, you know, across the whole, you know, the, the process to really be guaranteed that we end up with something that's sort of doing what we want. Um, and, and so, you know, in some sense, sort of this is, this is, you know, also the sort of inner alignment question here, right, where we're sort of really relying on it being the case that the overseer at each individual point in time is able to say, you know, is it the case that this model is sort of doing, you know, going into some really weird basin? Is it becoming deceptive? You know, is it doing something, you know, that we don't want? Uh, and, you know, provide, you know, feedback that is able to prevent it from, you know, going into that equilibrium. We can sort of think about this again, you know, as there's sort of being these two equilibrium here, where, you know, if we in fact get a model that is really helpful in trying to do the right thing, and it provides overseer to itself, you know, oversight to itself, it should say, yep, this model is really helpful, it's trying to do the right thing, so, you know, it gets good, you know, score according to me. But if you have a model that's really deceptive, then, you know, even though there's a human in the loop, it might still be able to trick the human and, you know, make it so that the human approval, you know, is still really positive for the deceptive model. And so we sort of still have these sorts of two equilibriums where you could end up with, you know, a deceptive model providing deceptive oversight, or you can end up with a really helpful, you know, good model providing good oversight. And we're, again, in this sort of equilibrium selection process where we're sort of really trying to make sure the, that the overseer can effectively guide us into the basin that we want, into the situation where the model is, you know, in fact doing the right thing. It's, you know, really trying to, you know, do what we want and do so in a way that, uh, you know, it can, you know, continuously keep it in that basin once it's there, which, you know, should, should, should be, uh, in fact, you know, a stable equilibrium uh, because, you know, you, it should, in fact, only oversee, you know, or, or, you know, a, a really helpful good model should provide good oversight to a really helpful good model. But whether we actually end up in that equilibrium is very unclear. Okay. And then, uh, you know, again, competitiveness. So um, implementation competitiveness is, you know, is really nice, you know, here. We, we, we absolutely know how to do effective, you know, RLHF style training. We can, in fact, train on, uh, you know, models, uh, you know, train models on reward signals given by humans, you know, given by models. Um, performance competitiveness is a little bit trickier because we don't really know whether, you know, it is in fact the case that this sort of trade, this sort of maximization process actually produces models which are able to accomplish the task that we want. Um, I think that there are some sort of in interesting sort of challenges here. So one example of sort of challenge is, well, it's very unclear if uh, you can actually provide oversight in such a way that gets the thing to actually do very complex tasks. So, you know, if you really want to do something really complex and really difficult to evaluate, like, you know, build a, you know, rocket ship, you know, it can be very difficult, you know, to distinguish between, well, if the rocket ship just looks good, that doesn't mean it's actually going to be an effective rocket ship, right? And so if you want to build a model that is going to be able to, you know, successfully produce rocket ships, um, it's, it, it might not be sufficient to, to just sort of have some overseer which is looking at the model's output and evaluating to what extent it thinks that output looks good. Because looks good might actually be a lower bar than, you know, uh, the sorts of things that we care about, right? It may, in fact, be the case that an actual successful rocket ship uh, you know, is very hard to build and very easy, and, you know, very, very hard to evaluate. That you can't really tell whether it's in fact going to work just from, you know, looking at it and sort of trying to give some approval signal. Um, and so this sort of, in some ways, you might even expect that this sort of hurts the model's capabilities. That, you know, if it were able to really just think through the problem itself and, you know, sort of, you know, just do some sort of HCH style thing where it's just sort of a bunch of, you know, you know mimicking something like, you know, an HCH process where it's just sort of, you know, a bunch of humans thinking through exactly how to solve the problem that they would be able to solve, you know, produce something successful. But if instead the model is sort of just producing the thing, the sort of minimal thing which would look good according to an overseer, the minimal thing that looks good according to an overseer might be worse, right? It might be the case that, in fact, you know, if you really put a bunch of effort and, you know, good, you know, thinking effort and it's trying to, you know, design a rocket ship, you can design a good rocket ship. But if you produce the minimal rocket ship that looks good to an overseer, you can produce a terrible rocket ship that just, you know, happens to have plans that look effective. Um, and so I think it's, in fact, quite unclear to what extent this is actually a competitive way to do things. Um, it may be, it may be the case that the oversight that we can provide is actually very effective, that it can distinguish it between, you know, good, you know, solutions and bad solutions, but it could also be the case that it's not effective, that, you know, in fact, it's actually, you know, worse for competitiveness. Question. Another thing I'm thinking of, though I'm not sure if this makes it actually any worse than HCH, is if what if like at higher levels we're trying to get it to do things that humans don't know how to do. Like for instance, let's say we want it to build a flying machine and we don't know how to fly. And it comes up with something that like the Wright Brothers plan. And I might think, well, I mean, I don't know why the model's saying that looks good. It doesn't even flap its wings. How is it going to get off the ground? So do you think that that would cause a problem with the approval maximization that wouldn't happen for HCH? Because in HCH, I mean, I guess I might not think of that idea either. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I think the thing you're describing is absolutely the sort of problem that can happen here. I think that, you know, one, one thing that is worth pointing out is that the way you're sort of hoping to try to avoid some of those problems here is that the overseer is not just a human. It is an amplified, you know, model, right? It is a human with access to the model. And so, 
uh, maybe the amplified you know, version is actually able to provide effective feedback in that situation. You know, the human can ask the model, can be like, okay, okay, but why are the, you know, the wings, do they not flap? You know, what is the reason for this? And you know, maybe you can get some explanation that actually allows the human to understand and effectively evaluate it. Very unclear though, right? So I think that that might help, but it, but it, but it might not. So, but that's at least the hope as to why you might hope that, you know, that this sort of thing would work in that situation. Okay. So, you know, this is our, uh, you know, that's approval-based amplification. There's other names also for, for you know, describing sorts of uh, schemes like approval-based amplification. We'll talk about this a little bit at the end. But, you know, basically this is the sort of RLHF, you know, style approach. Okay, so I want to move on to another one. So the next thing that I want to talk about is AI safety via debate. So what is AI safety via debate? So uh, here's the idea. Uh, we're going to train a model to win debates against a copy of itself in front of a human judge. So we have, uh, you know, the model. We ask some questions. So we're, again, sort of, you know, operating this sort of question answering framework. Uh, you know, we input some question. And then we sort of ask the model, you know, what it thinks. And then we have another model, which also provides some answer. And then those two models sort of, uh, you know, have a debate. You know, they sort of alternate, you know, saying turns about, you know, what they think about what the other model has said. And then eventually the human sort of gets to look at the output of the different models and decide, you know, which, which you know, thing that the model, you know, which model said the thing that it thought was more convincing was, was in fact more correct. Um, and then we train the model on the sort of approval signal of the human at the end of the debate, right? So previously we had this sort of approval maximization where it was, um, you know, maximizing the approval of an individual human, you know, potentially a human with access to the model. Now we're saying, well, it is just a human. They don't have access to a model, but they are not evaluating an individual model output. They're evaluating a whole debate transcript. They're evaluating, you know, two models sort of arguing back and forth on what the, you know, correct answer about some question should be. Okay. Um, and there's a couple of other sort of bells and whistles that often will be added on top of this sort of approach as well. One of them is cross-examination. So we'll often sort of allow models at individual points in the debate to sort of query other models from previous points in the debate and ask them arbitrary questions. So you can have the sort of model at the end, which you can go back to the model at the beginning and say, okay, you said that thing previously, it, you know, clarify this, you know, and explain what that thing was. This is the sort of thing that, you know, you can do with models that you can't necessarily do with humans in a debate, where, you know, you can't go back and make a, you know, make a copy of what the human looked like, you know, an hour ago previously in the debate and, you know, ask that alternative copy, you know, extra questions. So that's the thing that you can do in, you know, an AI debate that can help in, in various different ways. Um, it can give you the ability to sort of, uh, you know, make sure, you know, is the model actually answering consistently? You know, if it answers one way in one situation, another way in, one, in another situation, then, you know, you can see that by, you know, making a copy of the model previously and, you know, seeing that it's answering different ways. So there's sorts of things that you can do to sort of, you know, improve this scenario as well based on just like, you know, the most simple versions. But that's the basic idea. Um, another thing that we can also add on top is just sort of oversight. So we can still have, you know, the two models debating against each other can have the ability to, you know, whatever transparency, you know, oversight tools we might have that we've been talking about previously. Well, the models, you know, here can also have the ability to use them on each other. So, you know, one way to win the debate might be to prove that, you know, your partner is, you know, trying to deceive the human, right? You know, if you can use some transparency tools, look inside the other model and be like, ah, this model is, you know, doing something, you know, dastardly. Uh, you know, then maybe that's another way to win the debate. And so we can sort of try to say, well, you know, it, this is another way to incentivize the models to effectively, you know, try to oversee each other. Um, yeah, question. So if we're training these models to be, like, convincingly truthful and identify lies, aren't we also training it to be a very convincing liar that avoids being detected by itself? It looks like we're training two different things here. One of them is very dangerous. And we're kind of hoping the other one wins. That is, I think, exactly correct. It is totally the case that we are training the model, the sort of second debater, in some sense, to lie, right? So the first debater that sort of gets to pick their position first, it, you know, gets to pick the, 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 the best position, the most defensible position. But then the second debater is now in a situation where they can't pick that. They have to pick the next best position. And if the next best position is, you know, less truthful, then, yeah, we're sort of directly incentivizing the next debater to, you know, uh, you know be saying something which is untruthful. Now, the sort of hope is, well, if in the end, you know, we can incentivize the first debater to always say the truth, then the way you actually use this model is you don't actually run debates. You just ask the first debater what their position would be, and then you use that as, like, the truthful answer. And so you never actually query the second debater in, in practice when you're sort of deploying this model. Um, but of course, like I mentioned at the beginning, these are the copies of the same model, just in, in, in you know, different situations. One of them is trying to play the second debater, and one of them is trying to play the first debater. And so, yes, you know, to the extent that the second debater is, you know, really learns effectively how to lie and try to deceive, then you know, that also you know, is going to be something the first debater learns as well. And of course, it could be the case that equilibrium isn't the case, right? That the most convincing argument um, that you know, the first debater wants to make 
is not the truth, right? It could be that the most convincing argument is in fact totally different from the truth, that there's lots of ways to manipulate and deceive humans and you know, convince them of things that are not true. Um, that you know, the first debater will learn to stay instead. Now, of course, it needs to be the case that whatever the thing is that the first debater is convincing the human of that's a lie, that it's, um, there's no sort of effective way for the second debater to counter that, right? So if the first debater you know, says something that is untruthful, then it has to be you know, persuasive even in the face of the second debater trying to explain why it's untruthful. Um, but that is quite plausible. There's lots of situations where humans can be persuaded of false things even when they have heard the true argument for why that thing is, is in fact false. Okay, yeah, question. Yeah, and it's very similar, but yeah, I would expect that this will train them to be, in, to say things that humans um, want to hear. Like it's, it helps a little that they debate each other. Maybe there are some topics when we can change our minds, but this team still seems very scary, especially anything even a little related to politics, like, I imagine that not necessarily, yeah, the gradient is not necessarily towards truths, but towards so the, the thing that is easier to argue, for, easier to argue for, which might not be the truth. Uh, yeah, I just agree. I think that that is absolutely correct. I think that my inclination is also that this is a really, really tricky thing to get right because um, there is such a large difference in many cases between things that are convincing to humans and things that are actually true. Um, and so, you know, be, given that you know you, you you have just the human doing this evaluation at the end of the debate, yes, in some sense, the human doing the evaluation has the help of the debaters because they're each trying to explain why the other debater is wrong. But um, you know, it does seem you know absolutely the case that you know, there might be many ways for the debaters to sort of trick and, and you know uh, humans in very similar ways. There are some, in fact, even some nice concrete examples of ways in which this could happen in an AI debate. Um, the sort of you, the obfuscated arguments problem is maybe the sort of most canonical of these. Um, I'm not going to go into a bunch of detail on what that looks like, but there absolutely are cases where things can get very tricky for you know, actually you know, the sort of limit here being truth. Now, there are some things that you can do, right? So I mentioned stuff like cross-examination that can sort of help you know, alleviate some of these issues, but um, it definitely doesn't, it's, it's not clear you know, how, how much you can sort of solve uh, just by changing the sort of basic parameters of the debate. Okay, so, so we'll, we'll go through sort of again, you know, a quick analysis here. So, um, you know, the outer alignment sort of question here is again, just sort of this basic question of is the first debater sort of incentivized to be honest, right? Um, because the thing that we get here, this thing that we're trying to get is we're trying to get a model that sort of says the thing that is, um, has the property that it is sort of the most convincing argument, right? It is the thing that if the human saw, you know, whatever the possible, you know, most, you know, best possible answers to that argument would be, the human would still believe that that individual argument is the best. Uh, you know, that first argument. So that's the thing that we're sort of, that we, that we're sort of hoping that we get the first debater to always answer with. That the first debater always answers with whatever the sort of most convincing thing would be, you know, modulo, whatever the answers to that thing would be. Um, and we're hoping that thing is in fact truthful and honest and helpful. That, you know, whatever the most convincing thing is in that situation is in fact the, you know, the most truthful and helpful thing. And of course, there's, you know, lots of reasons to believe that might not be the case. There's lots of situations in which, you know, maybe humans can be convinced of things that um, are, you know, not in fact true. Uh, and so, you know, in that situation, we would sort of, you know, have some outer alignment issues. But the, the goal, at least, would be to get a model that is, in fact, saying that sort of most uh, persuasive thing, and that, that most persuasive thing would be true. Okay, but then, of course, there's also the inner alignment question of how do we actually even guarantee that we get that most persuasive thing at all? Because, you know, we have this sort of, you know, individual setup here where we have, you know, these individual debaters debating against each other. Um, there's a lot of weird things that can happen. So, you know, you can have things like if you have two deceptive debaters, and, you know, even in some sense, you know, the deceptive debaters could, you know, maybe use transparency tools to inspect each other and realize that the other one is deceptive and use that to win the debate. But if they're both deceptive, they can just agree not to do that. And then you, you never discover that they're deceptive and you just end up with a deceptive, you know, equilibrium, right? So similarly, you know, to how we've been talking about previously, there's an equilibrium selection problem where, you know, it is absolutely the case that, you know, the sort of limit of this procedure could just be, you know, two debaters that are both, you know, just trying to trick you uh, that, you know, never reveal that fact. Um, yeah, what's the question? Yeah, maybe that I don't understand this. Uh, my impression was that this is a sort of zero sum game between to the debater. At the end, we decide which one was right and give rewards and losses accordingly. I don't know how to zero people could, agents could cooperate in this zero sum. Yeah, so it is a zero sum according to the rewards, but as we really tried to stress, um, 
it is not necessarily zero come according to the agent's actual objectives, uh, right? right? So you yeah. could have models, and those models are deceptive. You know, maybe they care about some long-term goal eventually in the world. And according to that long-term goal, it might not be a zero-sum game anymore, right? They might be willing to cooperate in right now in training uh, to try to eventually get some other thing that they might want in the real world later, right? So even though in theory we have set up a zero-sum game, and so the agents shouldn't be cooperating with each other, there's no reason necessarily to expect that the actual algorithm we're going to get the models to be implanting is going to, you know, actually care about that, uh, you know, that, that fact, right? And so it could absolutely be a thing that is willing to cooperate for reasons other than, you know, just winning this debate game. Yeah, question. So if I'm understanding this, I, this like long-term goal thing correctly, is it like a case of these two deceptive debaters ask, okay, given these two possible answers to the question, which way would I prefer to be gradient descent towards in the future, and then they both just agree to let that side win? Like, well, they, I guess they both individually incentivize to let that side win. There doesn't need to be an actual agreement. Um, so that would be one example of a situation in which you could have, you know, deceptive debaters doing something weird. It's definitely not the only thing that you could have that would be weird like that. I mean, so a really simple thing would just be, well, if you have deceptive debaters and they, like, both want some, you know, weird thing eventually in the world, then they could just play the debate game exactly normally, except when they try to do the thing where they inspect the other debater and see whether the other debater is doing the right thing internally. They just, you know, glossed over the part where the other debater is deceptive like that, right? That's that's also, you know, another plausible thing where they're not necessarily thinking really critically about exactly what the gradient signal would do. They're just sort of, you know, not doing the thing which we need, which is effectively, you know, overseeing and understanding whether the other model is doing the right thing. Um, there's lots of versions of this, but I think the point, the thing that I want to point out is just that it is absolutely the case that there are weird equilibriums here, right? Where you could end up in a situation where you have a model and that model is doing the wrong thing, and because it's doing the wrong thing, it results in the debate going in such a way that reinforces that wrong thing. Um, and so it doesn't need to be the case that you actually end up with, you know, the sort of equilibrium that we want where it's, you know, always outputting the most persuasive argument. And of course, it also might be the case that the most persuasive argument is not even good at all. But, you know, we sort of have, again, you know, both of these problems, right? When we need to be the case that, you know, the most persuasive argument here is good, and also that, um, you know, the we actually end up in that desirable equilibrium. Um, Okay, and then we, again, we have the sort of implementation competitiveness. Um, I think that, you know, again, this is sort of, an, uh, this is a sort of game that we are at least, you know, often well situated to be able to train models to do. This is sort of very similar to the sort of way that we will train systems like AlphaGo, where you can just sort of have a zero sum, you know, RL game that you can train via self play, um, and then, you know, you know, train models to do well on the game. Um, performance competitiveness is, um, a little bit, you know, tricky here. I think the sort of idea of this sort of approach is we're saying, well, um, you know, by able to, um, by, you know, having the, you know, all of these various different arguments, you know, that we're sort of spelling out the whole thing, then it is the case that, you know, we can have really good evaluations, right? So we think about the spaceship example from earlier, where, well, we're saying, you know, is it in fact the case that by, you know, providing this evaluation signal and then maximizing the evaluation signal, we get a model that's actually able to do, you know, effectively do the sort of task that you wanted to do. Um, you might hope that it's easier to evaluate, you know, how good the spaceship actually will be if you have access to a debater that's trying to critique the spaceship and, you know, point out all the flaws in it. Um, but it's not clear, right? You know, it could totally still be the case that you can, you know, one of the debaters can make a really compelling case for, you know, why the spaceship would look great and, in fact, you know, would, would, would fail. And it would be better if you just had the model, you know, in fact, directly thinking about how to build it rather than just trying to, you know, produce the thing that would, you know, be the most persuasive. Um, and so that's absolutely still, you know, a competitiveness problem here as well. Okay. Great. Um, okay, so next up we have a sort of variant on the uh, debate system, uh, the sort of on, on AI safety via debate that is, that is in, in many ways very similar, but also a little bit different. This is the market making idea. So what is market making? So market making uh, is sort of similar to the debate game where we're still going to have a sort of debate structure where we sort of alternate between you know, models making various different arguments. But we're not going to have this sort of two-player structure anymore, where we have like you know two debaters arguing for two different positions. Um, instead, we do something like this: we have a question, we feed that question to uh, a a market, uh, a sort of market model, which says you know here are all the different possible. Here's a distribution on what I think the human is going to answer to this question after this whole procedure. Um, and then there's a sort of adversary, the sort of uh, in the in the game, which then sort of provides some additional information. And that additional information updates the market, uh, and then we sort of repeat this, and then eventually the human gets to look at all of the information provided and sort of produce their final answer. This is a, this is a little bit weird, so let me sort of try to uh, you know, ex explain what's happening here. 
So the idea is that the final answer, you know, the human is trained at the end to um, produce, you know, the human produces some final answer by looking at all of the various different information that's produced in the transcript. E the market at each individual point in time is trained to imitate what the human will say at the very, very end of the whole procedure. So after the human has seen all of the information provided in the procedure, the market is trained to imitate what the human will say at the very end. So you can think about this, right, as the human's judgment at the very end in the debate game, right? There's a whole transcript of, of you know, something that's happening of, you know, various different debaters going back and forth, and the market is trained to sort of predict at the end of that transcript, what will the human say? What will the final evaluation and judgment be of the human? Now, the way that we generate that transcript here is different than the debate game. So the way that we generate that transcript is each individual point in time, the market, right, is making predictions about what the human will eventually say. And the adversary is trained to produce whatever information will most change that prediction. Whatever information will most cause, most move the market, will most sort of cause the market's prediction about what the human will say at the end to be different than what it was previously. And so the idea here is to sort of approximate something like the limit of what the human would think after they had seen all possible arguments. So in the debate game, we were finding something, a uh, sort of equilibrium that was like, what would the human say after they saw the two best arguments? for a particular you know, thing, right? The best argument in favor, you know, the best argument against. In this case, we're doing something a little bit different. We're saying, what would the human say after the human had seen all possible arguments? Because at each individual point in time, the adversary is trained to produce the information which when given to the human at the end of the transcript would most move the market, right? Would most cause the human to say something different than what the market is currently predicting the human would say. And so in the limit, if you have an unexploitable market, if you can get to the point where the market knows exactly what the human you know, is making a prediction, such that there's no information that you could provide to the human that would change that prediction, then that market is in some sense approximating the human's judgment after seeing all possible information. Okay, that's a sort of idea here. And so it's, it's very similar to the debate game in that we have a um, situation where there is a sort of debate transcript, right? There's a bunch of information that is fed to a human and a human makes an evaluation. But rather than a sort of two-sided debate, we have in some sense a sort of infinite-sided debate where it is just a market that is predicting what the human will say and a, a sort of trader in the market that is trying to, to provide whatever information will move it to the greatest extent possible. Okay, this is a little bit tricky. I think in many ways this is sort of a maybe advanced version of, of debate uh, that sort of fixes some problems though still has many of the same issues um, but is, is nicer in some respects. Um, it's very related to debate. Does, does this sort of make sense? Yeah, questions? So just to be clear, the at the end, you do get to see not just what the market said, but what the adversary said as well, right? That's right. So the thing that the human sees at the end is everything that the adversary said in that particular transcript, right? So the market starts out with some prediction. The market is like, based on my knowledge of you know, how these sorts of you know, things usually go on, what the sorts of things that the human might see, here's what I think the, you know, the human's you know, final judgment will be. And then the adversary tries to you know, look at that market and see if there's anything the market hasn't taken into account, any individual piece of information it could give to the human that would change what the human says relative to the market, and then provides that information. And at the end, the human gets to look at all of the provided information and, pr and produce some judgment. And then you know, we, we sort of iterate by training the market on that new provided information. Yeah, question. So let's try to go through an example of the difference between this and debate. Let's look at this bad exa a hard example when you, the human is the pope in the 17th century and this is the Copernican debate. And originally he's pretty biased in favor of the Ptolemyan view. And in debate, he hears equal amount of arguments from Simplicio and Galileo and then decides. And here, originally, the market is 99% that the Pope will say that Ptolemy, but then the adversary is motivated for a long time to produce arguments on the Copernican view because it's easier to move to the 99% direction than the one. So then it converges. So then he hears a lot of Galilean arguments gets close to 50%, then the adversary starts to move him back, and then what happens? Uh, yes, yeah, so I think that the way you're sort of analyzing this is based, is sort of correct, where like, you know, if the, the market starts very convinced the human would say one thing, then, you know, there's a lot of opportunity if there are sort of good arguments in the other direction for the adversary to try to, you know, change that and push it back. And so if you start, you know, with this, you know, uh, you know, you know, incorrect in view of the solar system, then maybe you'll, you'll start providing some evidence in the other direction until, you know, it pushes, you know, if those arguments are in fact convincing, they will start, you know, pushing the, 
the the model, in, you know, the, the market and the human, you know, in the other direction. If eventually the human, you know, or the, and the market, which is you know a proxy for the human here, gets you know closer to fifty percent, then maybe uh, yes, it'll be you know it's very unclear, you know, then you know which arguments are more convincing. The hope like debate would be that the you know the, the convincing arguments, you know, or at least the ones that are convincing after you've seen all of their responses are the true arguments, right? That you know. Um, yes, maybe then the adversary will flip and will say some false thing about the solar system, but then it'll be really easy for the next adversary to be like, okay, now that you've you know pushed back in this direction, you know, I can just you know refute this because here's this you know a bunch of uh, you know, a bunch of information. And in the limit, there should be no reason for the adversary to ever say things that will result in uh, that will be easily refuted because if the adversary says something, it moves, and, and then the you know the next adversary can easily reply with no, this doesn't make any sense because of this. Then. The market shouldn't even move on that information because the market, you know, should, you know, if the market's sort of understanding what's going to happen at the end of this procedure, should see that the adversary has made some particular claim that is easily refutable. It knows the next adversary is going to refute that claim, and so the market should say, well, this this information isn't going to move the human at all because it's just going to be easily refuted. And that's the idea. And so there's sort of the limit of this procedure, right? If we think about what an unexploitable market would look like, right? You know, limiting in the same way that we sort of thought about HCH, the limit of an unexploitable market is a situation where there's no information that you could provide that would shift the human's beliefs relative to that distribution. That if a human you know, believes in that in the distribution that the market is predicting, no additional information that any adversary could produce would shift those beliefs. And so again, that's very similar to the debate equilibrium, where it is, you know, the sort of arguments that would be sort of most persuasive to the human, you know, regardless of what the most, you know, convincing counterargument that they saw. Um, but it's a little bit more general. Rather than a single counterargument, we're looking at sort of all possible, you know, pieces of information that could be provided to the human. Okay. Yeah. Questions. Uh, so I'm confused about what the market looks like in this case. Like, usually I think of a market as made up of agents making trades. Like, what would the agents be here and what are they treated? Yeah, so market is a bit of a loose analogy. Um, so I think that the way you can sort of think about this is that um, uh, in some sense, the thing that is happening here is that the, 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 the way the market analogy goes is that the adversary is sort of structured in such a way where they are incentivized to produce the information that would most allow them to sort of make money in the market. Um, and so if you treat this model distribution as a market, as a sort of like, uh, you know, if, if it were a market, it's not a market. In this case, it's just a single individual model predicting what the human will say. But if it were a market and you were to imagine it, analogize it to a market, then the things that the adversary are incentivized to say are exactly the things that would theoretically make that adversary the most money by saying those things in the market. And so that's the sort of analogy here. Um, you can sort of think about this in some sense as like market manipulation, where it's like, what are the things that the adversary could say, the sort of you know, words that would be useful to interject into the world, such that it would you know, allow them to make the most money trading, you know, insider trading on the market. That's the sort of thing that's happening here, where the, the adversary is able to produce, you know, is producing information which, most, which creates the largest market shifts that they can, they can anticipate and then profit on. Um, of course, it's not actually a market, and it's not actually a trader. But I think the analogy can sometimes be useful for understanding what, what's happening here. Yeah, uh, pass the mic. I, I'm uh, confused about like the training procedure here in more detail. Like, when does the adversaries like for like training this market on like some actual eventual human outputs? That really have to happen after like a finite number of adversaries suggested this. Um, even if you know. Maybe like the billion suggestion would move the human a little bit. So it's more we have to like stop or something. And I've been confused like what, how how long do we run this loop for? When does the adversary stop? How many suggestions does the like market get to predict the adversary recommends? Yeah. So it's, so it's, yes, this is a really good question. I think it's quite tricky. So the thing that you're sort of hoping here is that well, you you reuse the market, you know, over time, right? And so as the market learns the sorts of things that the adversary could say that would result in easy responses, like that the they would easily be refuted, and the sorts of things the adversary could say that would result in the human actually believing it, the market will get better and better about predicting, you know, okay, if the human were actually able to see a bunch of good information, this is the Thing that the human would believe, um, and so the market sort of could, should converge in some sense, like I was saying previously, to with something you know something unexploitable, something where there's no information that the adversary could provide that would you know shift the market's prediction, and an unexploitable market should have the property that right what it means for the market to be unexploitable in this case, what it would mean for a distribution over what the human says at the end to have no information, no nothing which the adversary could do which would move the market. What that means is it means that it is a distribution over what the human's beliefs are such that no additional information would change those beliefs, right? And so in some sense we're sort of hoping that the equilibrium here, the thing that the market should in some sense converge to if it's sort of the training is doing the thing that we want, it should converge to something which is an approximation of the the sort of you know that that thing I've been saying, right? The like uh, equilibrium of, of the human's beliefs after seeing all things. 
Now, it is a little bit tricky because of, of the sorts of you know, path-dependent effects, like you're saying, where, well, it's very unclear you know, what is happening over individual you know, runs, right? Like, in some sense, well, the market is sort of getting a little bit closer to what the human would say, each, uh, you know, human really think after seeing any individual run where the adversary says some information. But at each individual point in time, the market is sort of only expecting the adversary to say finite numbers of things. Um, and so that can be really tricky because, well, maybe the adversary said, maybe the market believes that there is some theoretical distribution that would be unexploitable, but is never achievable by any finite number of you know, things that the adversary could possibly say. Um, and then you know, maybe you won't converge to that. I'm not going to go too much into detail on how you might solve this. I think that problem is, is solvable, and I, I discuss it in more detail in the like, actual thing on this. Um, the thing I'll say very briefly is that the way you solve that problem is you give the adversary the ability to exhibit things that the market says on other inputs as one of, the things the market, one of the things the adversary can provide. And that allows you to simulate infinite depth um, without actually going to infinite depth. But, it's, but I don't want to go into too much detail on that. But, but suffice to say, if you are only interested in the limiting behavior, I do think you can solve that problem. But of course, the limiting behavior, like we've, we've stressed, is not necessarily you know, indicative of, of what it would actually do in practice. OK, yeah, question. Perhaps a more basic question. Um, what sort of questions do we expect debate to be useful for? Um, I can imagine a case where we would want it to, like the, the model to debate some sort of scientific claim, uh, which uh, if you were to come up with good arguments, you would need experimental evidence for, which you can't get because you're just the, the model that maybe doesn't have, have access to, to physical reality acts to run these experiments. So. Um, yeah, the the stronger model might just, or one model might win the argument that has stronger arguments just because the other one that is actually right might not have the experimental evidence or something that doesn't exist. So, yeah, uh, I can see that there might be a class of questions that is just not suitable for us, and I wonder whether you thought about which sort of questions are suitable for this and which ones aren't. Yeah, great question. So, um, so one thing I'll say is that you know I, I've sort of been mentioning you know a lot of these different approaches are sort of applicable in different situations. I totally agree that there's going to be situations where like a lot of the approaches we've been talking about you know today and, and even previously are sort of predicated on this sort of question answering setup. That the idea is well you know the thing we sort of most really want out of our AGI is you know for it to be able to take you know individual questions and answer them truthfully and effectively. Now in some sense you can sort of take almost any problem and sort of you know phrase it as a question answering problem. You know even you know even a, a problem of you know trying to you know directly act and accomplish some goal in the world can be you know, phrases, well, what is, you know, a helpful way, you know, useful, you know, thing for me to do to accomplish this, this task. Um, but it is totally the case that, you know, well, it's not clear that for a lot of the sorts of things that you might want to train an AI system to do, this is sort of the right frame or a useful frame. So, you know, especially in situations where, you know, you need to do a bunch of, you know, in, you know, direct sort of, you know, back and forth with the world, like if you're doing experiments or if you're doing something, um, you know, maybe you're just like running a factory, right? You know, it can be really difficult, you know, potentially to sort of get a model to do something like this. Now, I think that that is unclear. I think there totally are techniques where you could take almost any of these approaches and try to apply them in, in something like this. You know, you can do you know settings where the you know it gets to like you know you you first start by asking you know what are some ways to think about this? What are some experiments to run? Then maybe you in fact go run the experiments. You take the results of the experiments back and you like give them to the model. Now you're like okay, here's some information that you now have. Like you can imagine like in the market making setup, maybe the adversary has the ability to say you know look at this experiment. It'll be really useful. And then the human can you know go you know run you know say run this experiment. You know take the result back and it gets integrated into the thing, right? So you could imagine you know, modifying a lot of these sorts of things to you know, add in that sort of thing. But um, it is quite tricky. At least um, you know, it, it is totally plausible that for, for many of these, the sorts of things that you might want your system to do in, in, that sort of, in those sorts of cases, that this you know, won't, won't sort of necessarily work, work in, that, in that situation. OK, um, great. And so just like. Adding, you know, one other thing, you know, again, in the same way as debate, we can also add, you know, oversight. We can say that, uh, you know, um, I, I'm actually, I'm not going to go into too much detail on what oversight looks like here. It's basically a sort of version of the same way that uh, that you can do oversight uh, and, and cross examination and stuff in debate. Um, but but suffice it to say, it's very similar. You know, you can have situations where the models are trying to sort of inspect each other and provide that as produce that as evidence. Okay, and then I'm going to go only relatively briefly through this because it's very similar to the debate setup. But basically, you know, again, the goal here is we sort of want the model to be predicting what the human would think after seeing all possible arguments. And we're sort of relying on it being the case that, um, you know, there's no sort of, uh, you know, that all of the sort of, uh, you know, 
untrue persuasive things that you could be said, there is some way that, that you know, some, you know, other piece of information the adversary could produce that would sort of, you know, explain to the human why that thing is untrue and, and would give, you know, the human, you know, actual true beliefs. And so uh, we're sort of, again, relying on this very similar version of the, you know, in the debate claim. Uh, in the debate case, we're really relying on it being the case that, you know, the sort of most persuasive things really end up being, you know, the most true. Um, and then again, we're sort of relying on this sort of, uh, you know, oversight to sort of help us here. There's maybe some reasons that you might expect that you're less likely to get something like deception in this case. Um, one thing that's nice compared to debate in this case is that the adversary, uh, as opposed to the debater, is sort of not trying to, you know, accomplish some goal over time steps. So the debater in the debate game is sort of trying to get, you know, it's trained to get, you know, reward in the debate game over many individual debate steps. And here that's not the case. The adversary is just trying to do each individual piece of information producing. Uh, However, um, that's not a hard guarantee at all. It totally could be the case that you still end up with a model that actually has a long-term objective, um, you know, and is deceptive in, in any sort of way, um, despite the fact that you're, you know, you're only training on a, an individual one-step thing. Yeah, question. So using the Copernican example from before, let's say that you know, I'm the Pope and the adversary gives me the information of if you believe the uh, heliotropic theory then you are probably going to be kicked out of Pope and they're probably going to burn you with the stake. You should probably not listen to anything else that any of us have to say in case you actually wind up believing that and then are they able to lie to people convincingly. Let's say that is entirely true. Would that model still be aligned in that case by telling me this fact? Uh, I mean, I think it's very unclear. It sort of depends on what you want. It seems like probably we don't want that, right? Like that there's something that the model can say to the human that like, you know, causes the human to, you know, be 100% set in their beliefs and those beliefs are false and they can never be convinced otherwise. It seems like that's probably not what you, not what you sort of want to have happen in the situation. Um, maybe it is, you know, maybe like you're saying, there's a situation where like, you know, actually, you know, according to the Pope's values, this is really the thing that the Pope should do. But, um, I don't know. I mean, it depends on sort of what you're going for. I think that probably we would we would want it to not do that. Okay. Uh, okay. So one last proposal to cover that uh, is uh, this imitative generalization idea. So uh, this is also something that's talked about as learning the prior. So what is this? So um, we're again we have this setup where we have a human and the human answers questions. Um, and similarly to the amplification case, the human now has access to something to help them answer those questions. And in this case, that thing is some sort of model uh, slash information. It's some sort of very large database, a bunch of information that helps the model, maybe a large, or that helps the human answer the question, maybe a large collection of models, maybe just an individual model. It's some, you know, thing which is extremely useful to the human in answering the question. Um, and then uh, we sort of, we want to produce this thing. We want to have something which is really helpful for humans that effectively lets them answer you know, whatever questions we want as effectively as possible. And the way that we're going to train that thing is, well, we want it to be the case that whatever this thing is, this sort of information that we provide to the human, that that information, when given to the human, in fact results in the human making good answers to questions. So uh, we can, you know, in fact ask questions, you know, see whether those answers are correct, to, you know, and train to have the, you know, have this information be the case that when fed to the human, in fact results in correct things. And also, we want it to be the case that whatever this sort of set of information is, that is presumably going to be represented in some model, that that information is plausible a priori according to the human. Um, and those are the sort of two things we're trying to train this thing to do. So you can think of this thing as sort of a set of information, but effectively we can think of it as just a model. And we're training that model on two things. We want the sort of information represented in that model, the sorts of things that it says, to all sort of be plausible according to a human, and to in fact, when the human has access to that set of information, in fact result in you know, correct answers on you know, all the things that we can check. Okay. And the reason we might like this, the sort of theor the theoretical sort of grounding behind this sort of a thing, is that we're sort of approximating something like a uh, prior and an update on that prior. So we're saying, well, uh, we have some prior plausibility on information that is like, you know, how likely is this a priori? And then we have some likelihood that is like, well, updating that prior plausibility on the, uh, you know, how, to what extent that information in fact does a good job, those hypothesis actually does a good job at predicting the real things that we've seen in the world. We want to upweight the things that do a good job of predicting the world and downweight the things that do a bad job. And so we're sort of trying to mimic that updating procedure. You know, what if a human had the ability to actually just update on all possible information uh, you know, and, and come to some conclusion? Well, we can try to mimic that sort of a thing, that sort of human uh, you know, prior by saying, well, what is the most, well, what is the thing that would be most plausible according to a human and that would result in the best answers? You know, the prior and the likelihood. Lots of questions. 
So I like this, this solves several of the problems with debate, like for instance, the example I just gave before with the burning at the stake thing, because in this case, the, we want the, the human, we're going to be training a model on not just the human updating, the human saying what is true. But in that case, how do we determine what is true in the first place? Where does the accuracy loss come from? Yes, I think this is an extremely good question. Uh, and it's very tricky. So I think it has to sort of come from whatever information you have about the world, right? So any individual situation where you can make some prediction about something in the world, where you can gather some information uh, uh, where you, know, you can make some concrete prediction, then you can use that as information to update your hypothesis, right? We're trying to get at something like, what would the human's beliefs be if they had the ability to update on all the information available in the world, anything they could ever observe? And so we're trying to say is we're like, well, you know, there are we can you know just gather a data set of you know just making predictions about the world situations where you can say well here's something that happened and then something that happened next um, you know and if you can successfully make all those predictions you know uh, if a hypothesis successfully explains all of those predictions um, you know then it should have a really large update in favor of that hypothesis and so that's sort of the sort of thing right we're just saying well anything about the world that we can collect any data anything that we can predict about the world all of the information that we have access to you know those are all the things that we want to be updating on. Okay, but I still don't get where the accuracy loss comes from. Like, let's say the question is, is it day outside? It, does the model somehow know if it's day outside, or is the truth coming from what the human comes, says is true at the end of this process? Um, so so it, would, it would just come from something that we've collected. So maybe we've, in fact, collected a bunch of examples of situations in the past where it has been day or hasn't been night based on, you know, some information. And then in that situation, we would say, you know, can you, in fact, predict all these situations successfully? Um, you can even you do this in a, in, a, in a sort of unsupervised way. We just gather arbitrary information about the world and then train to predict some set of that information from some other set of that information. Because we're just trying to basically approximate, you know, do, do, does the hypothesis make good predictions about the world? And so any information that we know about the world, we want our hypothesis, you know, to in fact make, be making good predictions about it. But if we reliably have these facts about the world, why do we need this whole thing? Why can't we just use the facts? Well, because we want to get new facts about things in the future, right? So situations where we don't necessarily have the facts yet, we want to get a prediction about it, right? So, you know, for example, we might know, you know, in fact, what happened, you know, in 2023. But predicting what happens in 2023, given what happened in 2022, is extremely difficult. It's something that would be very valuable. And so we can try to, you know, you know, get a thing which is making those sorts of predictions by, you know, finding the hypothesis that best explains what actually happened in 2023 and is, you know, most likely according to the human prior. But like, so maybe I say there will not be an H1N1 pandemic in 2023. What do we judge the accuracy of that statement on based on the loss? Yeah, so you can't judge the accuracy of the like new statement that we have like no previous information, you know, to, to get, guide it, right? We're saying, the thing that we're hoping for is that this procedure results in a model which in fact makes good predictions about things because it finds the set of information that results in the best predictions in the past and is the most plausible, right? So, you know, in, in all of these cases, you know, we have no ability necessarily to, you know, the, the thing we're trying to do is get a model which is able to produce good effective answers on some new data that we haven't seen before. And the way that we're trying to do that here is we're trying to say, well, what is the sort of model that, you know, would, if we're thinking about it as like a hypothesis, that would be, you know, that would best explain the data we've seen so far and would be most plausible according to a human. That's the hypothesis that we should be using to look at future data and, you know, best make predictions about that future data. Okay. Um, and so the idea here is that um, we have this procedure, right? We have, you know, human has access to some model set of information that, you know, helps them answer questions. And then we can just train some model to, you know, imitate this, this whole procedure, right? To, you know, be able to effectively, you know, imitate exactly what the human would do given access to this, this you know, most plausible information, you know, uh, that, that has this, this property that is, you know, the, the greatest prior and likelihood. Um, and then this, you know, model we can use to, you know, a, a, as our sort of question answering system. Okay, so this is a little bit of a weird approach. In some sense, in some sense, it's very simple. We're just saying, you know, we want the, the thing to be plausible and, you know, we want it to, when given to a human, result in good, you know, output. And then we want to train a model to approximate this whole procedure. Um, but it's also a little bit weird. Um, you know, the reason we might hope that it's working is that it's doing, you know, something like approximating, you know, Bayesian inference. Um, but of course, it's very unclear whether it's actually doing that, right? Because in fact, the thing that we've done is we've just said, well, we want some model, right? Uh, you know, Z is just some model, you know, some algorithm which in fact results in good performance, uh, you know, on this data set of, you know, predictions and also, you know, seems plausible according to a human. And then we're like, okay, and then, uh, you know, that thing when fed to a human, you know, we just want to approximate it. Um, 
We have no necessary guarantee that it's actually going to be, you know, the hypothesis that would be the sort of thing that would, you know, be this be what the human would, um, you know, actually think if they, you know, considered all the possible information and selected the best possible hypothesis. But maybe it is something like an approximation of that. Okay, and again, we can also sort of have some oversight here, but I'm not going to go into too much detail on what it would look like, but it's very similar to what we talked about previously and stuff like imitative amplification. Um, okay, and so uh, the goal here, right, is we're trying to produce a model uh, that is sort of mimicking what the human would, you know, what hypotheses the human would have after they've been able to update on all possible information that they could see about the world. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to talk too much about the properties of this. I think it's a little bit weird and tricky. But um, you know, very briefly, um, there are you know, some sort of weird outer alignment issues here. Um, it can be very hard to incentivize Z to really contain all the correct information, um, especially because there can be inconsistencies across individual questions, uh, or like there can be double updating across individual questions. There's a bunch of very sort of tricky issues about getting it to do the right thing. Um, even in the case where you really believe that it is actually the thing which has the property, that it is the you know, most plausible according to the human and results in the best outputs. Um, because of the way that you're doing this procedure where each sort of output is evaluated independently, things can still get a little bit tricky about whether it is actually equivalent to the sort of correct Bayesian update. And then there's the sort of inner alignment issues here as well where you know, we, we don't necessarily even, you know, there's no reason to believe that you know, Z would actually approximate anything like the, the real hypothesis that we would want here. In some sense, the sort of only difference between something like this and just sort of directly training a model to produce good answers and sort of seem good to a human, which would be like the RLHF case, is we're, we're sort of adding a human in front. We're saying, well, you have to produce good answers such that when a human has access to you, it produces good answers and also seem plausible to a human. Um, but it's unclear how much that change actually results in you know, helping, us, helping us find like a better basin. Um, it's absolutely still possible, you know, that we could get a deceptive model in this case, um, and so it is a little bit unclear. Um, I won't talk too much about the competitiveness here either. It's very similar uh, to um, a lot of the approaches we've talked about previously. Um, the hope sort of would be that, you know, if you can get something like this approximation of a, you know, an actual sort of update of the human, then you can sort of approximate something like, you know, the best possible judgment, uh, you know, of the human. But you're still in some sense limited by what that best possible judgment of the human would look like, you know, in some ways very similar to H stage, where you're sort of limited by what the, you know, best possible thing would be that humans would be able to do given, you know, ability to consult with all these other humans. Okay. Um, so those are all of the ones I want to talk about right now. There's some other approaches that I'm not going to talk about, but that are also maybe relevant. Um, recursive reward modeling is, is, is one approach. I think that the way that we have talked about approval-based amplification in this talk, though, is, is very, very similar and essentially encompasses recursive reward modeling. So we, we've effectively dealt with that approach. There are others that we sort of haven't talked about. Um, STEM AI is one um, where the idea would be to sort of understand, you know, to just sort of use your models on, uh, you know, individual narrow like mathematical or scientific tasks and not try to do any human, you know, prediction or question answering in general at all. Um, there's other sort of approaches like narrow reward modeling. We really just want to focus on using models for individual narrow tasks. And I'm not going to go through all of the you know, other possible approaches. But um, hopefully the idea at least right now is to sort of give an overview at least of the specific, you know, some of the leading sort of approaches and how people are thinking about trying to move into the regime of you know, evaluating models in superhuman settings, right? Where a lot of the approaches we've talked about previously, you know, up, you know, prior to today have been, you know, things that have been really focused on, you know, more like current models and trying to bridge the gap from current models to uh, you know, these sorts of you know, things that are starting to get to AGI. But we also sort of have to also deal with things that are bridging the gap from AGI and beyond. And so a lot of the approaches we talked about today are starting to maybe address that thing, you know, giving us this ability to scale our ability to oversee our models and provide good feedback uh, you know, beyond the point where we can literally just the things that humans can evaluate directly. But they're very tricky, right? All of these approaches have you know, a bunch of really tricky you know, issues with them and things that really have to be, you have to be able to get right to make them work. Um, and so it's very unclear. Um, I think one final thing that I will leave with before we do questions, and I don't necessarily want, uh, you, you don't have to give your answer to this right now or, or even ever, but I think that a good exercise, you know, maybe a take home exercise in terms of sort of thinking about a lot of the things that I, we've sort of talked about across all of this is just sort of, you know, at some point in time, I think that we, like as a society, are going to have to make decisions, right? About what sorts of things we actually, you know, want to go through with. What are the sorts of proposals we actually want to do? And these are really, really hard and difficult decisions. Um, and I think in many cases, a lot of these decisions will be, have, to be, have to be made under a lot of uncertainty. Right now, we have a ton of uncertainty, right? We've gone through all of these approaches, and a conclusion has been for basically all of them, we don't know, you know? Here are some things that might work, here are some things that might not work. It's very unclear whether they work. Um, 
But in many cases, it's not clear whether that uncertainty will be resolved. And so in a lot of cases, we do have to sort of end up making decisions that are the best that we possibly can under uncertainty. And so how do we actually do that? You know, what decisions would we actually make that would be the best possible decisions under uncertainty is a thing that we're going to really have to grapple with. And so I think starting to grapple with that question yourself and thinking, you know, what would we do given the uncertainty that we currently have is a really useful thing to sort of start um, dealing with and sort of understanding, well, what are the proposals, you know, that we would start, you know, what are the things, and there's multiple criteria here. It's not necessarily just what is the best approach, right, that is most likely to succeed. It's also what is the thing that, if it fails, would be the least catastrophic. Okay, and that, uh, with that, I'll, we'll, we'll sort of end here and, and open it up for, for final uh, questions. Anything else? Well, what would your uh, recommended proposal be to open AI if we can define it? Oh, that's a, that's a good one. Um, very tricky. I think personally, currently, I think that um, you know, we, are, we are in a regime right now where I think it makes more sense to do things like the predictive models style approach, where you know, rather than trying to really aggressively you know, scale these models and train on like, approval signals that we might not trust, you know, we can try to do you know, prediction cases where we can trust them. But like I said previously, I think that that will stop working. Uh, you know, and so it's not uh, a scalable approach, but I do think that like, if I were you know, to say, well, what would we do right now? I think that's the sort of thing that you'd, you'd start, you want to start with. Um, but uh, that's sort of a cop out because it's not sort of addressing this answer of, well, you know, if we really want to just sort of, as we sort of you know, start scaling more, what are the things that we really need to do to be able to you know, align these models and, and get them to do the right thing even into the you know, highly superhuman regime? And then it starts to break down even more. You know? and, and I don't know if I have a, I don't, I don't have a, a, a really good answer. I think that there's some things that we can sort of analyze as like you know, convergently useful. So you know, in a lot of these approaches that we talked about today, you know, stuff like having good oversight tools, having good transparency is extremely important. So we can at least prioritize you know, particular research directions that are likely to help with those sorts of things. Um, and you know, I do have like you know some preferences. You know, some of the sorts of proposals here that I like better, some that I like worse. Um, I, I, I tend to be you know in favor of things like imitative amplification. Um, market making is one that I, I came up with, and so I you know have some amount of, of attachment to it. Though I think it has a lot of issues, um, similar to debate. Um, but I, I don't. I, I certainly don't have an answer. I also think there's a lot to be said for microscope AI if it's possible. But um, we, we'd have to actually succeed on being able to do a lot of very successful transparency you know, to be able to do it. And I think that that is, at least currently, you know, not something we're really succeeding on. Though, you know, like I mentioned, you know, it seems something that seems like for a lot of these approaches extremely convergently useful. And so if we you know, were able to succeed on that more effectively, then it would unlock a lot of possibilities. Yeah, question. Yeah. Um, so a lot of these approaches rely on, or they start where we fail to trust our um, feedback signals, um, and flip something like reward, uh, or like flip something like RLHF. The most common thing is to provide binary feedback, which is a really like inefficient use of humans to provide feedback. I mean, if I were to give feedback on this talk, I wouldn't say thumbs up, thumbs down, I would probably just like get into the weeds of like what I liked or what I disliked, what I disagree with, where I was confused. And that can be done by means of using language or some other, I don't know, form of, of communications. Um, how might we, um, like, yeah, I guess my question is, has somebody looked into how we can provide better feedback and is that uh, an avenue that uh, is fruitful in your opinion? Yeah. So, yeah, good question. Um, in terms of providing non-binary feedback, this is absolutely a thing that you can and has been done with current models. So Ethan Perez has a, has a paper on this looking into how you can provide natural language feedback um, that, um, that, that, that can be quite effective in a similar you know, way to binary feedback in RLHF. So I, d I don't think it's the case that like, we only do binary feedback currently. Um, there, are, there are absolutely ways that you can do, you know, more, um, you know, detailed feedback than that. Though it's unclear whether, you know, I think in some ways you should sort of think about that as it's not clearly making the feedback better. It's just making it more efficient, right? 
you could have gotten all of that information by doing binary feedback, but the binary feedback is very inefficient because you have to have a lot of examples of slight tweaks, you know, to get all of the information that the binary feedback, you know, out of the binary feedback. And you can just sort of get a lot more information out of the, um, the, the language feedback. But it's not clear that that's actually making the feedback better, right? Like in situations where the human is in fact just confused and like is saying the wrong, you know, it has incorrect beliefs about whether the thing is good or not, then binary or language feedback or, you know, getting more detailed feedback from the human doesn't help because that feedback is, you know, incorrect. And so it doesn't necessarily make the feedback better, though it does make it more efficient, which can help you, you know, maybe get more feedback. But again, you know, getting more feedback is only so helpful as long as that feedback is good, right? And so the sort of key problem, you know, is not necessarily just the, the you know, quantity of feedback, but the quality of feedback. You know, the ability to actually believe that that feedback is in, is in fact correct, that the human is actually understanding what's happening to provide, you know, good feedback there. But is, I mean, in that particular approach, I worked on this during the summer as well, would if from the end of the journey, um, yeah. In that particular approach, we're not trying to uh, the, the reward model. What what we did was basically like take the language uh, or like we had a, a model who prompted it to like write a summary and then gave some feedback, same model and uh, ask it to rewrite the summary and chuck that to reward model they evolved. Um and so in that sense it hasn't yet been used for R L H F uh, to like have more um of the sort of feedback that is richer. Um, I agree with you that to some degree, uh, it's just making the process more efficient as in like, instead of giving a, 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 uh, a ton of, of thumbs up and, and down, you can just like provide one another sentence that has more um, information content. I disagree, however, with, with the point where um, you said that we can't clearly communicate the confusion. I, I guess it, in natural language, I can say, well, I'm not quite sure how to give you feedback on this because I'm confused. Whereas with thumbs up, thumbs sound, you can't do that. Even within the limit where you can just like, uh, you know, bit infinite feedback on the, even the minute details of like how the behavior of the agent is to be rated. Yeah, good points. So a couple of things. So first, I, I generally will think of um, a lot of those sorts of processes where you're, you're training on feedback of some variety and then getting the model to sort of score well on that feedback as relatively continuous. And so I don't do that much differentiation usually between like was there a preference model or was there not a preference model. Um, I think you can differentiate between those things. And so sometimes it can make sense and, and the details can matter, though I think that um, oftentimes they're not, they're not that important um, in terms of just like the overall al alignment properties, but, but sometimes they can matter. But that's at least why I refer to it as, 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 as RLHF. Um, in terms of the sort of concrete question of you know, communicating confusion, I totally agree. And I think there can be cases where the human is in fact confused and you're able to sort of you know, address that problem being able to communicate the confusion. I think that the issue remains, however, that there are situations where, you know, for example, the human doesn't know they're confused, right? That the human thinks they are giving correct feedback. They think they understand what's happening, but in fact, the human is incorrect. The human doesn't understand what's happening. Um, and in that situation, you know, there is, you know, we, we sort of need something else other than the human to, you know, help the human or somehow produce, you know, give the human more information to give a more informed response. Because if we are only limited by the human's ability to understand and evaluate, then we are, you know, fundamentally bottlenecked by things that humans can effectively evaluate. And there are going to be situations where even when, you know, where, also where, where humans can't always know whether they're evaluating effectively. Where, you know, if we're, you know, yes, we can try to limit it into cases where, you know, the humans believe they're evaluating things effectively and, you know, have some, you know, positive evaluation. But there are going to be cases where, you know, that that is also not sufficient, where the humans believe they're evaluating effectively, but are in fact, you know, have some, you know, limitation. You know, they don't actually understand what's happening effectively. And so we still sort of have to, in some sense, go beyond. So I think that, like, you know, a lot of these approaches are still sort of trying to address that problem, right? Of you know, how do we go beyond that the, the feedback that a human is 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 ever able to provide? You know, situations where the human is just confused, you know, or or you know, doesn't know that they're confused. You know, the human has some incorrect belief, but in fact is just, um, you know, thinks they're thinks that they understand what's happening. And and that can happen, especially when you're training a model to say things that look good to a human, right? If you're training the model to produce, you know, rocket ship designs that look really good to the human, then you're going to be in a situation where many of those situations, you know, it's going to look good and the human's going to think it's great, but in fact, you know, it's it's not going to actually work in practice because it, it was only optimized to look look good according to the human. And so in some sense, you know, you need some better evaluation signal to sort of be able to address that. Question. 
I'm not sure whether this is the police or such a meta question, but do you have any research advice for people starting to look into these theoretical questions? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I'm not going to try to like right now recommend any like particular you know places or things to do because you know the field is constantly changing. I think that um, in terms of just like you know in general, you know, just you know listening to and understanding all of these sorts of things, I think is extremely important. Just like having the basic concepts, understanding the sorts of things that people are talking about in the field, and the way in which the sort of the basic structure of the problem is, I think, basically always valuable in all, essentially any you know position that one might be in. Um, I think that you know one of the sort of issues, you know, ways that the sort of field currently is operating is that um, we just we don't know what to do, right? We're in a situation where we have a lot of ideas, we have things that might work, we have some reasons why they might work or might not work, but we don't know what to do, right? There isn't some, you know, this is the thing that you know we need to accomplish. This is the, you know, everyone's on board with, you know, this is the approach, right? And so in that situation, I think it's very important to, you know, have a good general understanding of like, okay, here are the sorts of things that are being discussed, here is sort of how to understand and sort of the basic concepts, because it's very unclear, you know, what the actual correct thing is to be doing. And so having an open mind and being able to try to figure out what the correct thing is to be doing is, is really important. Another sort of piece of advice that I will often give that I think is important is um, try to sort of, you know, I think it's really valuable to, uh, for people to really, you know, be individually like, you know, specialized in individual things. I think that, you know, there's a lot of things to be doing. And uh, you know, it's really important to understand, like I was just saying, all of these various different sort of uh, you know concepts and, and stuff. But I think that you know, then we also have to do something, right? And so you know, making some you know bet, trying to figure out some place where you can be helpful and really concretely accomplish something that you know you think is useful, and then really doing that thing, I think is you know, you know what I what I think is really the most valuable, right? And so you know, I try to you know in like the the, the mentorship program, uh, you know, try to get people to um, you know understand the basic concepts and really understand how to think about AI safety and what sorts of interventions might be effective and then you know find an intervention you know that they can do something that you know might be helpful and really execute effectively on that so I think that's sort of that's very broad but that's sort of generally how I think about you know you know trying to address this so having having good concrete models about how things are going to go and what sort of you know ways in which things might go poorly and things that you can do to make things go better and then you know finding individual particular interventions and, and trying to execute as, as best you can on them Okay, uh, we will call it there. So that was the last talk. So this is uh, you know the end for this. But hopefully, I have you know given you know a, a lot of good you know tools and understanding and concepts to sort of understand you know and, and help you know think about this sort of general field uh, of AI safety.